Hello, I'm Gary Imlach and this is the story of the 2002 Tour de France, starting here in Luxembourg, the Tour's first foreign start for four years. In cycling terms, of course, it might as well have been Texas. Lance Armstrong came into this race as a huge favourite to join the exclusive club of riders who've won four tours, and the even more exclusive club of riders who've won four straight. <laughs> Trying to win as many tours as Miguel and Eddie and Ancatil and Copi and, and these guys, those aren't my motivations in life. Those aren't my motivations in sport. My goal is to be happy and to be successful and to work hard and to, and to earn my money and to prove that it can be done. And that's a year by year thing. On the subject of this year's thing, Armstrong, in public at least, disagrees with those who are already printing up the Lance Makes It Four t-shirts in preparation for Paris. For some reason, I think this will be the hardest of the, of the last three, the last four. I think this will be tough. I think we'll see depth in teams, depth in the field that we haven't seen before. Uh, and that's why I'm just thankful that we have such a strong team. Because I, I, I think that you're going to see the Alnces and the Kelmes and the Benestos, uh, the Kofidises. I mean, you're going to see strong teams with three or four guys in the climbs that make life hard. As an endurance event, the Tour is rivaled only by Armstrong's relationship with the French public. They haven't exactly clasped him to their collective bosom over the course of three Tour wins, so it's unlikely that a fourth will make a difference. It's sometimes frustrating because you see riders they accept, riders they really cherish and love and cuddle and, and scream for, and it's the guys that in the group you say, I don't ever want to be like that guy. <laughs> I mean, it's just... No offense, but I want to be the guy that just keeps his mouth shut, works hard, is true to his team, true to his family, true to his sport, and gives a full effort and wins the race. That's the guy that I want to be. I don't want to put a flower on my head or take a picture or, 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 or do a song and dance. I just want to be a sportsman and win the biggest bike race in the world. And that's what you kind of hope that the people on the roadside say, look at there, in French. They would say, Chapeau, look at the guy. Trained harder than anybody else, wanted it more than anybody else, and he got it. Well, the big question is whether anyone can stop Armstrong getting it for the fourth straight year, and the pre-race consensus seems to be probably not. But then people say that about every great tour champion until the year that it actually happens, and there are certainly riders in the race capable of rattling Armstrong's bottle cage. Hello and welcome to the 89th edition of the Tour de France, which next year will celebrate its centenary. Now that may sound strange, but of course the World War years interrupted the progress of this race. We go back in fact to 1903, when the smoking chimney sweep, Maurice Garin, won the very first Tour de France. And my goodness me, what a long way this race has come. It's now more popular than ever. I'm Phil Liggett, joined of course by my pal Paul Sherwin in commentary now as we look at this year's Tour de France. It started in Luxembourg and it hasn't been there since 1989. On that occasion, Pedro Delgado was the defending champion. This year, of course, it's the American Lance Armstrong and he's a hotter favourite than ever, Paul. Well, before the start, Armstrong is the number one favourite. I don't see anybody else challenging him. But I actually asked him how he thought this was going to be, this fourth attempt to try and win the event. Well, he said the first win was really my comeback. The second win was confirmation. The third was absolutely just for pleasure. The fourth one is going to be the most difficult one to win. I think he's right, and it is a very unusual course this year, and we'll explain more of that in a moment. But it's not just about Lance Armstrong from America this time around. There are other riders now from America leading the foreign teams. For example, Tyler Hamilton, CSC from Denmark, and you've got Levi Leipheimer, first tour for him, and looking very good after his tour of Spain last year. 
and also finishing well in the Route du Sud just before the Tour de France starts. He's a great challenger. I think maybe just a little young to come to the Tour de France for the first time and hope to lead a team to get himself onto the podium. But it will be interesting to follow his progress over the big mountain stages and, of course, in the individual time trials. But let's not forget two other American riders, two men riding for Team Telecom with the possibility of riding their own race, Kevin Livingston and Bobby Julik. Yeah. Good point because, of course, Jan Ulrich not here, out all year with injury and not having a very good season at all. The Tour Prologue is a bit like the first day of the cricket season. There's no relying on the weather and a damp start in Luxembourg meant one more worry for the riders on top of a tight technical course with cobbled sections and a sharp climb to the finish. But as we join the action, Kelme Santiago Botero, one of the genuine challengers to Lance Armstrong, was bearing down on it. There's the clock now. So Santiago Botero, they were all right to worry about this man. You best time and a good one. Nine minutes and 12 seconds. And now back here, we're looking behind the scenes here. Young man is passing Lance Armstrong a drink. And Lance Armstrong very politely, I think, there, just saying, no thanks, not for the moment. Raimundus Rumsas is coming up to the line right now. A very impressive time by him as well, as we get another champion in the starting gate, Christoph Moro. And Rumsas has done another great ride here, the Lamprey boy. It is going to be the best time. Now, we are a little bit surprised. He's a great time trial, but I really didn't think that he was going to get inside the time of Botero. Well, the organization normally provide a skin suit yellow jersey kit, but Armstrong has decided to stay with his team colors, the former world champion, the man who's won the Tour de France three times, it's his right, and he's chosen now to give it his best shot. Armstrong is a brilliant prologue rider. He's proved to that in the past, and he came back after his terrible ordeal with cancer. He won the prologue. He went on to win the Tour de France. Once again, he started in a big gear, but look at this cadence. He's up around 100, 105 revolutions for every minute. This is quite remarkable as we rejoin at the front of the race. You can see the performance of Christophe Moreau coming into the last 500 meters. In a moment or so, we should get the time check for Lance Armstrong, the last man on the road of the opening prologue today. This is going to be a special ride from Laurent Jalabert here. He is going to challenge the leaderboard of Raimundus Rumsas. And look at the face set here. Bjorn Arise is his trainer. There's the time. Can he produce the sprint and shock us all? We never thought of Laurent Jalabert to win the prologue. He is getting all the cheers of France. He's on top of the board. 9-10.52. Paul, it's time for the experts to leave, I think. Well, we're looking at Lance Armstrong now. Can he pulls something special out of the bag and take away the prologue victory and the first yellow jersey in the Tour de France and this man is unbelievable when he turns up the power and we know he's got that power we still believe he could pip uh, Laurent Jalabert on the line he is the only man left on course who can possibly do it now Jalabert is the leader Ramsas is second Batero is third David Miller is fourth Laurent Brochard is fifth that's the order in now can this man upset it and Pierce either win or finish second? This is going to be close and it might well yet be the winning ride. Armstrong is coming down this finishing straight like a Grand Prix motor car. He is powering up here. There is a USA flag blocking our view right now, but Armstrong and everybody here is banging on the board and shouting his name as he races towards the line. It is going to be close. It is going to be a desperate spin for the line and he is going to get it. Lance Armstrong has won the prologue. 9.8.78. How on earth did he do that? So confirmation, both of the result and all his rival's worst fears. Lance Armstrong with an opening day statement of intent. Still only two seconds ahead of Laurent Jalabert, who put in an even better performance, really, when you consider what he was expected to do. Lance, congratulations on the yellow jersey. Are you going to defend it for the rest of the uh, first half of the race? I don't know. We have to see. It's We have to evaluate all options and see what happens with time bonuses and breakaways, but... We'll see tonight. I have to talk to the team. That's right. You're not going to be dazzled by the, uh, the great record of uh, wearing the yellow jersey from start to finish? Uh, that would be, I think, a mistake. It's better to, to try to wear this jersey in Paris and, and be smart along the way. If you have to give it away for a few days, then we'll do that. So, seven kilometers down, just the 3,270 and a half to go. Let's take a look at the route now as it's going to unfold over the next 22 days. Following the 
prologue, there's another circular stage to make sure Luxembourg gets its money's worth. Then a quick detour into Germany where the telecom team will be under orders to pace Eric Zabel into position for a home win. Inevitably after three tour victories, the route is littered with good omens for Lance Armstrong. When the race finally hits France, it's in Metz where he took the race lead for good in 1999. This time it's a stage start on the way into Champagne country, providing that extra incentive for the day's winners. A couple of bottles on the team manager's table, and the riders allowed to sniff the cork as a special treat. The team time trial switches the focus from the stars to their supporting cast. A crash cost US Postal time last year, but the big onus is usually on the team of the yellow jersey holder not to lose it for him. Stage four marks the start of a high-speed chase across northern France for the sprinters, culminating in the first acid test of the tour. Lactic acid, that is. Stage nine is a 55-kilometer individual time trial along the coast at Lorient. By the end of it, you should have a clear idea of the strength of the defending champion and his challengers. French air traffic control permitting, the riders then head south to Bordeaux for a day's rest before the mountains. Since it's an anti-clockwise year, that means the Pyrenees first and massive support in the Spanish climates. A punishing first day over the Col d'Obisque and up to La Mange is followed by a five-climb monster on stage 12, finishing at Plateau de Bay, where Marco Pantani won four years ago. There's usually a couple of days respite between the Pyrenees and the Alps, this year, though, features a return to possibly the most feared climb in cycling, Mont Ventoux. Lance Armstrong gave this stage away two years ago, and he's regretted it ever since. He'll be desperate to take the win. After the second rest day, it's on to the Alps, starting with Les Deux Alpes, where Jan Ulrich famously cracked and lost the tour in 1998. Then it's on to another mountain finish at La Plagne via the Col de Madeleine, where Armstrong fooled everyone that he was cracking last year. Depending on the mountain stages, the time trial to Macdon will either be the final showdown or the final flourish. Then all the survivors can relax and roll into Paris. Now, Lance Armstrong isn't the rider who gets carried away by romance very much. He's usually fairly calculating when it comes to winning bike races. Still, the inescapable fact was that he had the chance to go into history as the first rider since Romain Mice in 1935 to wear the yellow jersey on the tour from start to finish. The course is a 192.5 kilometer loop around Luxembourg, but the interesting thing to look at is the profile. Two third category climbs, two fourth category climbs, and the same uphill finish that had the veins bulging on the riders' faces yesterday. Lance Armstrong was doing his impression of a French presidential candidate at the start, kissing babies, well, kissing his own, and saying nothing of any real substance. As the riders rolled out on the first road stage of the tour, there was word from the US postal camp that Lance was happy to let his rivals make the running, and they duly started to make it. Heading for the first sprint of the day was Armstrong's closest challenger, Laurent Jalabert, in the green jersey, along with the two big rivals for the points competition, Eric Zabel and Stuart O'Grady. Zabel, celebrating his 32nd birthday, took it ahead of O'Grady and Jalabert, but Jalabert's two-second time bonus made him now the race leader on the road by two-tenths of a second. Stage one was turning into a nightmare for Christophe Moreau, who'd managed to get involved in his second crash of the day. And it really wasn't the kind of stage that you could afford to. The action up at the front was relentless. And after the initial three leaders were caught, along with the bunch that had chased them down, there was another attack. With nine kilometers left, a group of six riders were trying to put significant distance between themselves and the main bunch. And the gap surely isn't enough, but there is the climb at around two kilometers, slight, no, around one kilometer to go. It's two kilometers uh, uphill, this. 
There's the peloton. Now, Landis is in a very good position because on his team is Lance Armstrong, the race leader. His instructions are simple. Go with the move, but don't assist it to escape. He has every reason to become the passenger, and if he's got the legs, he could even go alone. Eight seconds to go. Welcome to Deutsche Telekom, the team of Eric Zabel. The job is now on Zabel's birthday to hunt down the breakaway and get the present ready. These guys are still surviving. There are six men at the front of this bike race, Phil. The last time check was just eight seconds. That is not very much more than 100 metres. Well, Paul... Well, sorry. <laughs> there it is. It's not even that, mate. It's all over. Telecom and Deutsche Telecom have shut down the breakaway at the three kilometres to go. After this wonderful day's racing, it is again all together. Those with the legs that are one or two behind now, but basically all of the feel that matters is here. Look at the men lining up now in front of Eric Zabel. There is the champion of Germany, Danilo Hondo. There is Fanini. There is Zabel. It's 20 seconds, Phil, for the first man to cross the line. 12 seconds for the man who finishes second and eight seconds for the man who finishes third. Those point seconds are going to be so important at the end of today. Also moving forward, Robbie McEwen, your favourite from Australia. He's got a huge chance today if he can hang on. That Now the telecom boys are finding this climb is a little bit distressing because it, it's a lovely road surface. It'll turn right towards the top and then we'll line up for the finish. This is tremendous pacemaking being done here. And the man doing it is Andy Flickinger, a Frenchman on the AG2R. But he's got no team around him, so he may as well move out. He's done that. The champion of Germany now, Danilo Hondo. And they'll do it one by one here. Let's go as quickly as they can. Lose their position and hope that the last man left on the front is Eric Zabel but he's very closely marked by the sprinters and there's always the trouble that somebody will slip away and there's a move on the right and it is again a Lamprey rider giving it just about everything that is an unbelievable move by Team Lamprey coming out of the pack well, I think it is Belas Vosic of uh, Latvia who's gone from the Lamprey team now, if he's got the legs, can he hang on? Because he hasn't got much more strength left there. The peloton are still shadow boxing here if they can. Those legs must be screaming with pain now. The telecom riders are still holding the back of the sprint as best they can. Well, this could be the steal of the day and richly deserved because we've seen a tremendous day of racing. But, you know, there's still the acceleration of the sprinters now as Baden Cook is trying to get in on the scene. The other Australian newcomer to the Tour de France now. The clash of swords. The legs are going, but it's too late. He's got victory on the line and Zabel and McEwen take the second and third. But a great, great win there. And we still think that the rider was Rubens Bertogliato. And there is the stage result. Not a 1 2 3 scene often in international cycling, but Toliati, Zabel, McEwen, with Oscar Freire up contending in his first tour and Stuart O'Grady sixth. And if the stage result was a surprise, what about this? Batoliati catapulted into the yellow jersey by the 20 second win bonus. That is about as close as Jan Ulrich is going to get to this year's race, I think. Of course, last year when the Tour route was announced, it must have seemed like a great idea. Germany's one and only ever Tour de France winner. Best man to promote it when it comes into the country. Of course, that was before Jan Ulrich's knee injury ruled him out of the race and his recent pill-popping exploits at a party got him back in the headlines this week. Now, we've heard Jan Ulrich's excuse, which was that the drug-taking was purely recreational, but I doubt that that cuts much ice with the team telecom management, because the fact is that when he's in the peloton and fully fit, Jan Ulrich is probably the most talented rider in it. But to go with his one-tour victory, he now has four second places. And if you look at his weight problems, and now what we should uh, call, I suppose, personal indiscipline problems, it's hard to imagine him ever again riding a man with the kind of ruthless dedication to his task that Lance Armstrong has. All right, enough of a lecture to Jan. Let's get back to the race out on the road. And with 11 kilometres to go, the action was pretty much an all-German affair. Jens Voigt trying to stay away from the bunch to sneak a home win. And Team Telecom leading the chase, determined to set up the same thing for Eric Zabel. This is going to be a rip-roaring charge into the line. Ludo Dirksens is in the middle there in the Lamprey, the, the Belgian national, former Belgian national champion. Axel Merckx was there. There's the world champion as well, Oscar Ferreira. All of the big men are moving to the forward right now. 
chaos it is at the front right now. Everybody wants to stay in 15th, 20th place. They don't want to touch their brakes. One thing about riding at this moment in the stage of the Tour de France, if you touch your brakes, you can slide back to 30th or 40th place. And in fact, Eric Zabel in the green jersey just on the right-hand side there seems to be a little bit too far back right now. And he is actually, oh, there's, he's pushing Danilo Hondo forward there. You see that move from the green jersey on Eric Zabel? He wants Hondo to take him a little bit further forward. He's using his teammates sensibly right now. Ferreira is moving across now onto the wheel of the green jersey. This is a question of who breaks first on who breaks last as they go around this nice little chicane for the moment. Still a bit of disorganization on the front end of the main field as we get one of the telecom riders looking back to see where the rest of the guys are with five kilometers to go. Well, I haven't noticed the capture of the leader, but I am going to presume now that he is uh, he has been caught as we're watching here under the four kilometer banner the charge down into town these corners are very very tricky and precarious because everybody wants to hold their position you're leaning right into the corner getting the knee down as far as possible to lower your center of gravity and hopefully not lose a gap on the wheel in front of you right now lotto are in control it's a lotto telecom train at the moment we are touching speeds phil approaching 35 miles an hour right now it really is going to be a mad dash the yellow jersey is in second position the world champion is in fourth position the man who wears the green jersey there Eric Zabel is in seventh position everybody is battling for the wheels of the sprinters we are now looking to see when the red kite is going to appear and I think if my memory serves me correctly it's just after this bridge well Ludo Dirksen hats off to the Belgian rider here who is trying to drag this young man of 23 years of age to his second stage win in as many days and he's forcing the yellow jersey he's got no more legs left and he's put him on the front, which is where he should not be right now, because as they go 1,000 metres from the finish, there is still a left hand to come. Watch still the whereabouts of the green jersey of Zabel. This is a big moment for him now as he turns into the corner on the shoulder of Robbie McEwen, the champion of Australia. There's, I thought there'd been a crash for a moment. They took it wide. There was a crash. Somebody's gone down there, but it's not the two men we expected, as lead out is still coming now. The yellow jersey washed away. Watch for the men to break from the centre in green. Oscar Freire is there too as they try for this one. Freddy Rodriguez is about seven men down now. Danilo Hondo is the lead out man. Then it will be Jean Matteo Fanini. Then it will be Zabel with Hunter on his wheel. McEwen on his wheel and Freire on his wheel. Now they move over. Now the green comes on the right. Zabel on the right. Freire on the left with McEwen. It's the three of them go for the line. And the world champion has taken it. Oscar Freire with Zabel and McEwen the runners up. So, Oscar Freire adds a debut Tour de France stage win to his two world championships, just in case anyone thought they were flukes, and afterwards he had his rainbow collar felt by Matt Randall. Oscar tiene una colección formidable de, de, de mallas, ¿no? de jerseys, y ahora 11 segundos le separa de, de la Mayo John. Eh, ¿Qué está pensando? Este, ¿Con qué va a soñar por la noche? No, por la noche no sé con qué soñaré, ¿eh? pero no sé, yo creo que... Ahora mi objetivo era también conseguir una etapa y, y en ningún momento pienso en el mayo amarillo, pero lo que está claro es que si, si puedo conseguirlo no lo voy a desaprovechar. For the second day and very much against the odds, Rubens Batoliati stood on the podium in yellow, but having ridden intelligently at the front of the bunch all day, you have to say he deserved it. Well, it wasn't a stage for Lance today, but for the men who reckoned they could sprint themselves into the race lead on the way from Metz to Vans. 174.5 kilometers, with bonuses available at three sprints along the way, as well as the finish, of course. Now we're sweeping across this beautiful city of Vans. Uh, it'll shortly narrow down before we line up for the actual finish, uh, just down the side of the main Metz to Paris motorway. Tell you what, Eric Zabel's a long way further back right now, and Robbie McEwen's up into third place. Right on his wheel is Fabio Baldato. There is Michael Sandstone. He's looking over his shoulder to see just exactly what the position is of Laurent Jalabert. The Estonian national champion is in there, Jan Kersibu in the dark blue jersey there, but looks to me as if Eric Zabel is an awful long way down right now. This is going to be a real sprint for the line. Robbie Hunter's in there too. He's going to try and do it. This is a last-minute attack. That's probably going to be a man like Nico 
Matin from Coffiness. A good move by him, trying to surprise all of the sprinters coming off the front, hitting them just at the right time. It is Nico Matin, but he hasn't surprised anybody at all today. He's just going off the front of the main pack, but they're just reassembling behind him. That will cause a bit of consternation for Team Lotto. It's caused a bit of disorganisation. Squeezing through the gap there in the green jersey is Eric Zabel. They're all over the road right now, trying to organise themselves. There are no teammates at all of Eric Zabel. He's having to count on the other sprinters right now. Hunter is there in fourth position. There is the world champion, Oscar Freire. There's a big line on the right-hand side now. This is coming from Alessio. Well, Alessio have a great sprinter too, and it's even off, and he's about three men back. And I must say that there's no team got control of this race today. They are all out of control because Telecom tried and couldn't. Lotto have got a little bit confused, but watch out for Robbie McEwen. He's got the third place position there, and that is the best right now. Here comes the swing, and it's Hondo taking them through. Break hard, and it's very narrow. They'll sight it now. They've made it safely because it was dry, and now they've got a chance to go for the goal. The big sprinters are there. Zabel will have to take on Oscar Freire. He'll have to take on the McEwen as group again because they're all there now. And again, Robbie Hunter trying to lead out the world champion teammate, but he's got on the back wheel there instead. Fabio Baldato is there. Uh, Baden Cook is in the centre, the little squat rider in white as Credit Agricole tried to bring through Tor Hoshoff here. This is going to be a most amazing finish because still the green jersey of Zabel is deep in the peloton. And in that peloton too is Braden Cook. Now Zabel making his move as Hoshoff is trying to win. This is the man who finished last yesterday, finished 20 minutes behind. It's keeping the sprint going here for the line. And on his wheel is still Hunter as I think Zabel is boxed in, but now McEwen comes. McEwen is going to lead out to Eric Zabel for the line. Robbie McEwen, I don't think, is going to lose this one. He's moving off his line. There'll be a protest, but McEwen, for the moment, gets the win. I waited and waited, took my chance, and this time I got across to the barriers, and uh, I saw Zabel coming, but uh, with a tailwind slide uphill, I thought I could hold it, and oh, that's nice. <laughs> Well, there were questions asked about whether Robbie cut across Eric Zabel in the final sprint, but there was no protest from Team Telecom, so he was safe to celebrate with his wife Angelique and Ewan McEwen, the rhyming baby, making his tour debut at the age of less than two months. If his dad keeps going, he might make it onto the podium like Eric Zabel's son does every year. So there's the stage result. McEwen, Zabel and another Aussie, Baden Cook, in his first ever tour, taking an impressive third place. Eric Zabel led the race coming into the day, and here's what he thought of the likelihood that his team might keep him there. Mm, not so high. <laughs> <laughs> because we, we see the circuit, uh, we train uh, on this road, and it's hard, and the wind stays like this. It's a lot of headwind, so it, it comes uh, much more harder then. And don't forget uh, the, our best free time trialist stay at home <laughs> so I think uh, the chance for you as post with Lance Armstrong is a little bit higher. A victory in a team time trial is very very good for the team spirit. It's really a performance that they accomplish together and uh, the, the couple of days after a victory like that is really uh, you can do amazing things with, uh, with a spirit like that. Uh, today is a very important stage for us uh, especially for Lance. <coughs> If we can, uh, if, he, if he can do well, uh, he, Lance will be able uh, to get some uh, extra time on, on the main guys and the general classification. We had last year, we had a problem in the team time trial because of the rain. So um, if it will be dry, I will be very happy. In my opinion, I think we have a great team for the team time trial. I think that we can, barring accidents, I think we can buy time there. Yeah, well, we all know the Tour de France, uh, there's so much that can happen. So we, we always have our guard up and it's going to be very hard no matter what so we do have to concentrate on that uh, but the team is riding well and Lance is riding super strong so we are confident and we hope we have good luck. Well the route today was 67 and a half kilometers from Epinay to Chateau Thierry heading mainly due west which would mean strong headwinds and punctuated by a testing climb at the halfway point. Eric Zabel and the telecom team were among the early starters but weren't even fast enough to post the best time of the first seven teams to go. We pick it up now with the big five all out on the road. CSC Tiscali have gone through the first checkpoint with the best time, but fastest through the second, despite losing a rider to a puncture, are on say. Let's join Phil Liggett and Paul Sherwin.
this should be a very interesting time coming in because it is almost certainly going to wipe Faso Bortolo away completely. By about a minute and 45 seconds, I would think, if they've continued their progress, well, they've had their share of bad luck too. They've lost a man very early on today with a flat tyre. It happened at 24 kilometres in, so they've ridden over 40 kilometres without a one-man on the team, uh, Pradera. But this time is going to be a sensational one and will be the time to beat, I think, for sure. Onse have lived up to the reputation as a great team time trial outfit. Look at that time now. 1.21 was the best time. They're going to be inside at 1.20 for the ride. Big sprint to the line required. They have to put the stopwatch on the fifth man over the line. But they've held it together very well despite the early problem. They bring eight men home, best time, 1.19.49 for Onse. And now they can sit down and it'll take 20 minutes to finish this race now. And they're going to have to see just is it good enough to give them the race leader. This team we're looking at now, Tyler Hamilton's team and the team of Laurent Jalabert have taken the risk of leaving one of their strong men behind, the Michael Sandstod. He's just had a flat tyre. They have to keep the pressure on as much as possible because Laurent Jalabert's dream at the moment is getting himself into the yellow jersey. He started his day at the same time as Lance Armstrong in the overall standings. They had a nine seconds advantage over the best place of the Once riders, Igor Gonzalez de Galdiano. So as long as they can finish in front of Once and US Postal Service, Lawrence Jalabert will be in yellow tonight. Just look at all of the riders in this magnificent US Postal team. They are all still together. And I think Lance has put the blocks on a little bit to say, let's just steady it down. We don't have to win this race. Well, it's, it's not important for him to win this race. The important thing is to stay in a reasonable amount of contact with CSC Tiscali and, of course, with the Onse squad. Because if one of these other teams were to take the yellow jersey, he knows over the next few flat stages they are going to do everything to control it. If, for example, Laurent Jalabert gets the yellow jersey tonight, he will fight tooth and nail to keep himself in yellow for as long as absolutely possible. But here they are, the blue train. Here they are indeed, second best time at seven kilometers before the finish. Now, I don't think they can bridge the 38 seconds. They were behind Onse at that point. Uh, but if they come over the line here in second, they finished fourth in this race last year, by the way. And uh, a similar time position today is, is the worst they can expect. Second or third, I think, is the best. But they're going to push themselves right to the limit. You can see riders dropping off now, job done. They only need five to cross the line for the time. Ekimov has peeled off on the far right there now. The most important thing is, of course, that Lance Armstrong finishes with those five riders. Floyd Landis also here and looking good. As they drive up to the line, they've just popped down into second place, but they'll be coming across the line quite clearly in second place, putting Fasa Bortolo down into third, with two teams still to finish. The arrival of US Postal, they'll be well satisfied with this day. One at 20 they pulled a lot back over the last 10 kilometers there. In fact, only losing just over 15 seconds to Onse at the end of the day. So they pulled themselves back a good 20 seconds over the last seven kilometers of racing. And I'd say a lot of that went down to George Hinkepi, Lance Armstrong, and Yatislav Ekimov. The important thing, though, is not losing today's stage, but keeping the team together as a collective. They will have high morale tonight. They will be happy with this performance. And so it looks like a third place finish for CSC. Bad luck uh, taking them perhaps off the leaderboard, or was it the consistency of the other two who persisted and beat them? Third, 1-20-35, and so the new Mayo Jean of the Tour de France will be Igor Gonzalez de Galliano in only his second Tour de France. And here's the result that put him there. The favourites US Postal beaten into second place by 16 seconds, CSC Tiscali third, an excellent ride by David Miller's Coff and his team to take fifth. Today was stage five of the Tour de France and coming into it, there were encouraging signs that we might have a bit of a race on our hands. Onse had confirmed Lance Armstrong's pre-race prediction that they'd be one of the strongest teams by being stronger than his in the team time trial. The question now is, can they use their strength in debt to launch a full-scale challenge on the defending champion? El valor o el triunfo de, de la Once Roski es el trabajo en conjunto, ¿no? Creo que hemos trabajado muy bien. Algunos desde el coche, Manolo dirigiendo y otros dando a, a los pedales, ¿no? Cada uno en su trabajo. 
es realmente donde se ve el trabajo de, de un director ¿no? y creo que lo hace mejor que nadie. Yo creo que son muy gentiles, ¿no? Yo digo que la especialidad de la contarlo por equipos es como un rally, ¿no? Yo soy el copiloto que va diciendo las cosas, pero el que pone el esfuerzo, el que pone la técnica, el que pone toda la sabiduría es el piloto, ¿no? Y ellos son los pilotos los que hacen todo el esfuerzo, los que hacen todo el sacrificio. Y al, al término, pues cuando acaba la, la victoria es suya y, y la felicitación es para ellos, ¿no? Pues, pero ahora como director deportivo, el trabajo duro comienza, ¿cierto? Sí, es un tour difícil, es un tour donde nosotros tenemos muchas ambiciones. Yo creo que hemos dado un paso importante, sobre todo mental, ¿no? para la psicología un poco de, del equipo. Y ahora debemos de seguir pensando en todo el tour, con nuestras ambiciones, con nuestras ganas, con nuestros sueños. Y es verdad que Astron es el gran favorito, pero que yo siempre digo ¿no? que aunque él sea el gran favorito, que nos permitan a los demás soñar. Y nosotros tenemos que soñar con ganarle, ¿no? Entonces, pues, vamos a luchar un poquito por ello. Well, today's route didn't look like much of a threat to Onsay's plans. 195 flat kilometers from Soissons to Rouen. Perfect for the sprinters, or the kind of breakaway that often develops the day after a big stage like the team time trial, when everyone's tired. The unwelcome distinction of first rider to abandon the tour went to Tom Steeles, the Mappe sprinter who's perhaps still suffering the after effects of glandular fever. And after an early crash, Richard Vergonc was in a bit of discomfort too, getting running repairs from the race doctor. After a couple of unsuccessful attempts, a five-man breakaway did form, and in it were Belgium's Ludo Dirksens and the Estonian sprinter Jan Kersipu. They were joined by Italy's Stefano Casagranda, Christoph Edelin of France, and Michael Sandstott, the Danish CSC rider, whose puncture cost them the team time trial. So this is all happening at 19 kilometers to go now. The gap has just come through at 2 minutes and 23 seconds. McGee has a flat tire, and as Paul has said, a tough one. There's been a terrific crash in the back here. The cameras are now organizing. Quite a few riders are stunned down there. A lot of the Uscatel riders, one of the Lamprey riders on the far right of the road. Uh, doesn't look uh, terribly good at all, but this is a tremendous crash at high speed, and uh, we don't know how it happened. Our camera's switching to the back of the race. Oh. Well, this indicating a lot of riders were under serious pressure. There's the national champion, Nicolas Vaugondi. He's there. There's a Lamprey rider who is down and not looking very good at all. He looks in serious difficulty, and that, in fact, is Marco Pinotti. Bocharov is in there as well, the AG2R leader. He is also involved in that crash, but I have to say, Marco Pinotti is not looking very good Gerard Port the doctor is right there alongside him in the white shirt but this shows that the riders of the Tour de France at the moment are under serious pressure when a group goes down like that it shows that there is a lot of fatigue creeping in and so in these last uh, 15 kilometers of the race today it is in total disarray at the back and in fact uh, Didier Roos is trying to get away from the peloton and he has been joined by Laurent Dufault I don't know if we'll see pictures of this because I'm not too sure we've got too many cameras left right now uh, but two riders are ahead of the peloton the crowd continues to cheer here at just under 15 kilometers to go to the finish and we are in fact passing through here the town where the great Jacques Anquetil rests in Cancompois and there he is this is in fact uh, the gravestone of uh, the great Jacques Anquetil and that uh, his signature on the right he died in 1987 and he wasn't that old really the most brilliant ride in the Tour de France five times a winner 51 times he wore the leader's yellow jersey now this of course is not allowed and if the referees see it these riders will be penalized both in time and money because rules are quite clear you cannot take shelter for more than 50 meters behind your team vehicle they are now under the five kilometers to go so they too are beginning the descent into the city of Rouen there the gendarme working overtime to warn the riders about those nasty little bits of furniture in the center of the road but this uh, I think can only be the saving grace of the breakaway it's much easier to descend at speed in a small group than a big peloton 
they're all working and this and now the counter-attacking uh, is going to come from the five in the front and they're not going to work together now it could be fatal to do that they need to keep the rhythm on if they start shadow boxing they're finished for the day Sandstod I think will go soon he cannot afford a sprint finish he can't sprint and watch out for the man at the back Casa Grande I think if anybody's going to beat Kersey Poo today it is the Italian on the back of this line and now Casa Grande has made his move he's moved again they're forcing Kersey Poo to chase all of these little counter attacks he's putting a lot of pressure now the move coming from Sandstod he's just got himself back on Kersey Poo again has to dig deep again he has to nail down these attacks one at a time they know he's the fastest man in the group but watch out the best time to attack right now would be for Ludo Dirksens to go straight over the top they're inside the final kilometer they've 30 seconds advantage over the main field they will survive today but watch out for the move coming by the young Frenchman because that's the time to go when they sat up he had to make the running he's the lead out man now and Kersey Poo has locked on the big sprinter a chance to return to the top in a Tour de France for him and claim a third stage win. Casagrande bits his teeth, but Kersey Poo saw him come. Kersey Poo straight into his slipstream here now. Dirksen has been dodging wheels and still holding on to third place. Now Casagrande has made the mistake. Kersey Poo won't come yet. He try and will wait until the last possible moment. But they've done a good one. They've got him back in the lead. Sorry about the tunnel, but we're back in view now. Casagrande on the middle of our picture. And now Sandstone Richie's teeth again to try and make amends for yesterday. He goes for the line, but Kersey Poo is in the perfect position. Dirksen is going to take him on. Dirksen is going to go for young Kersey Poo. Now there's not many of them. We'll get over Kersey Poo. Kersey Poo is now clear and is going to get the win, but only just. He gets it on the line from Sandstott, Dirksen, Casagranda, Edelin. Well, it was close, but for the first time this tour, a breakaway stayed away with Jan Kersipu winning a low-speed chase at the line from his fellow escapees. From the look on your face as you came across the line, you had given that everything. Yeah, I had everything and even a little bit more. I was really... I had nothing left. When did you realise that it was just going to be between you five? Well, I, I thought... I started to thought that we were since 25 kilometres to go. Then I... Uh, I saw that it's, uh, we're going to make it. And this is what Kersipu's win does to the overall standings. Absolutely nothing. Igor Gonzalez de Galdiano leads four seconds ahead of his teammate Josiba Belocchi, with Lance Armstrong another three seconds back. Now, with three consecutive flat stages leading up to the individual time trial on stage nine, nothing dramatic was likely to change in the race for the yellow jersey. For the points competition, though, they could be crucial days. Through the middle comes Eric Zarb with a green jersey on the line. That's it, Eric is in green. Robbie McEwen, I don't think, is going to lose this one. He's moving off his line. There'll be a protest, but McEwen, for the moment, gets the win. Now Stuart O'Grady is going to try, O'Grady is going to edge it, oh and it was so close on the line but he thinks he got it. Now the green comes on the right, Zarbel on the right, Freire on the left with McEwen, it's the three of them go for the line and the world champion has taken it, Oscar Freire with Zarbel and McEwen the runners up. The green jersey is the competition for the Tour's hourly paid workers. Not just sprinters, but hard men who come out every day to earn their points. And there are two ways to get them. At the finish, points are awarded on a sliding scale to the first 25 riders across the line. That's why we saw Eric Zabel and Robbie McEwen fighting for sixth place yesterday. It was worth 20 points. There are also points available out on the road at hotspot sprints. Six for the first man under the banner, four for the second, and two for the third. So, while the yellow jersey holder can sit quietly in the bunch on flat stages and just keep an eye on his rivals, green jersey contenders have to be out there working every stage. The hardest working man in bike business the last six years has been Eric Zabel, who's won a record half a dozen green jerseys in a row. Last year, he held off a strong challenge from Stuart O'Grady. This year, Robbie McEwen is trying to bring the run to an end, and he's out sprinted Zabel at the finish on the last three stages. It's uh, very close between uh, Robbie and me and also the other Australian riders uh, like uh, Cook and uh, O'Grady are still still in shape and uh, we see what's happened the next days. 
So currently the points competition looks like this. Zabel's lead is down to just two points after Robbie McEwen out sprinted him yesterday. The impressive Baden Cook in his first tour is lying third. And yesterday's stage win has Jan Kursipu ahead of Stuart O'Grady for the moment. And the reason the next three days are so important is because after the time trial on stage nine, the tour heads south to the mountains. And there, the sprinters won't be earning any points. They'll be hanging on at the back. Now, one final thing about the green jersey competition, and it's this thing. Now, it doesn't look very dangerous. I mean, you'd struggle to hijack a plane with it. But according to the tour organization, this is an offensive weapon. The problem is that PMU, who sponsor the green jersey, distribute hundreds of these things every day, presumably so that fans can give the riders a big hand at the finish. Cue laughter from the studio audience. However, Robbie McEwen wasn't laughing the other day as the fans hung over the barrier and rants, waving these things in his path during the final sprint. I got hit with a couple of those in the arm, got hit in the head by one, um, got a bit of skin off my arm, but um, yeah, well, scars, I mean, it's not too bad. I feel like a little school kid going, look, mum, I hurt myself, but uh, I'm impressed. But you know, it's like I'm doing 60 something k an hour and, and people are heading, I've got another one on my shoulder, and lucky I had a helmet on, otherwise I could have a big, big one across my head, but uh, you know, I had to get away from the barriers then because I, I was scared that someone was going to hit me in the face with a hand and I'd, I'd lose it that way rather than someone riding past me. Yeah, and pure speed. Well, there's the stage six route just on 200 kilometres to Alençon, and there were a possible 53 green jersey points available, six apiece for winning the three hotspot sprints, and 35 for winning the stage. Well, Robbie McEwen took the first six, out sprinting Zabel, who only picked up two points for third behind Jan Sverada, and that four point swing meant McEwen was now the leader on the road in the green jersey competition by two points. A little before the first sprint had been the first crash of the day. David Miller was caught up in it and suffered cuts to his arms and legs, but he got back on and rejoined the main bunch. Well, Eric is a brilliant competitor. He will not take defeat lightly. There's McEwen, though. He's just passed out of view, but he's over to the left of our picture, about four men down. I've noticed Freire is there as well, and also Baden Cuck is right tucked into, very close to Eric Zabel. The three Aussies are ganging up on him again. What a superb approach the line this is by the stars of the tour here comes Ludo Dixons now McEwen checks himself in the center screen there Baden Cook is also off to the left of uh, left of our picture to the right of McEwen the peloton are out of it now and glad to be I think this is a vicious finish today Dixons has got the front Danilo Honda looks over his shoulder he's looking for the whereabouts of Zabel as the sprint now starts and this is going to be a very very difficult sprint it's Fabio Baldato trying for the run here now he hasn't got the legs it's very very sharp right Right hand, the Honda round in second place. Zabel not quite there on the train just yet as our camera tries to catch up. Now Baldato in trouble, I think. This is going to be the final run for the line now. It's the champion of Germany leading out here. Then it'll be Gian Matteo Fagnini. Zabel is there in fourth place. The left of the picture, Teddy Agricole is trying. Now Robbie McEwen has got the wheel, but watch out for Freire. Freire is on the wheel of Zabel. Zabel is leading out the world champion. McEwen is trying on the left. McEwen and Zabel. This is going to be McEwen again. Right on the line. Zabel has got him. Zabel has taken him on the line. And that is how you say I'm still in this bike race. So Eric Zabel, who started the day in green by just two points, finished in green by seven after a short detour into second place out on the road. I must say I'm very happy now to win the stage. Uh, on the, on this way, but I think so. so uh, uh, you were right. Uh, Robbie McEwen is uh, from the wheel, uh, mostly from my wheel. One of the fastest guys. This year it's very hard for me to win uh, when I uh, start in front. As we indicated at the top of the show, all that excitement left the race for the yellow jersey completely untouched. Well, there's today's obstacle course, 176 kilometers from Bagnol de Lorne to Avranche. A couple of fourth category climbs along the way and another 53 possible points on offer for the sprinters in the green jersey competition. In yellow for the third day, Igor Gonzalez de Galtiano, of course, would have a full complement of Onse bodyguards, including the man in second place behind him, Yoseba Belocchi. Well, today's escape committee was three strong. Anthony Morat of Credit Agricole, Domo's Leon Van Bon, and Frank Renier of the Bonjour team. 
Between them, they built up a lead of more than five minutes and in the process mopped up all the intermediate sprints, so no change in the green jersey competition out on the road. No competition at all for the strangest shot of the day, David Echebarria working on his aerodynamics in advance of the time trial. And it might have had something to do with the second strangest shot, because it came just after Echebarria got a 25 mile an hour peck on the cheek from Roberto Liseca. The first crash of the day wasn't a serious one, but it left Jonathan Vortas seriously adrift of the bunch because his bike was more seriously damaged than he was. Alessio driving the race on here now. Telecom willing to work, hoping that Zabel can have those ageing legs of his and the more stamina than the lesser ageing legs of Oscar Freire and uh, Robbie McEwen in the spin. There's, there's a crash, crash. There's a crash. And this again is a situation. Let's have a look and see if any of the riders who are high in the overall standings have been caught out. Number 12 there for Team Telecom is Rolf Aldag. He's a big worker. Again there, Christoph Agnoluto, AG2R, number 182. He is down. It looks as if there's a large, tall, credit agricole rider. That may be Jonathan Vortas, again having a bad Lampre day. He's gone Paul, Marco Serpolini, and there's somebody oh, the world, world champion, champion Ferreira. is down. Oscar oh. Freire has taken a very nasty fall. Now, this is a man whose whole career has been dogged by physical problems, and this is extremely sad, and it's his back again. It's his back that has given him the problems in the past. There's somebody else right underneath him from Lamprey down there. Well, that, he just popped his head up for the last minute. That, uh, that is ditch is rather thing. deeper than it appears, it seems. A lot of riders are down here and delayed. Oh. And Christophe Moreau, 61, is down as well. This is bad. There's Jonathan Vortas. Stewie O'Grady is there as well, I think, on the left-hand side. You can see that a lot of men have gone down. Frederic Bessy, number 52. The Credi Agricole riders all here waiting for their leader. And Christophe Moreau, I think, more dejected psychologically here, Phil, than anything else. But just how many Credi Agricole riders fell down? Because I don't think they're waiting for... I think they must have been almost all riding together as they crashed. Obviously, Moreau is down, looking very cool and collected. The rider on the right, Roger Leger, won't believe this, attending all of his team. Freire looks as though he might be on his way, but he's back. And this is a serious problem for Oscar. His back has been a problem, and now he looks as though he's given a real good clout in that ditch. Well, he's a man I thought would be capable of getting up this climb towards the finish, and that is going to change the complete physiognomy of the race finish here right now because he's a tough guy at the end of the day. Moreau is up and riding. There's a guy down on the ground there, and I think that is Didier Roos, in fact. The four, it is Didier Roos, the former national champion of France. He's been involved in several crashes since the start, and this one doesn't look too good. The way no. he's holding his arm there right now, it looks as if it might be a collarbone problem there. Well, three days running. Let's hope that's the end of it. Now, as we leave them behind, desperate straight to the front as well. The latest gap is 18 seconds. Anthony Moran won't know half of his team, not half, three quarters, are all lying on the road as a couple of kilometres behind him. Leon Van Bonn has gone to the front. He may as well try something because they're coming very, very There's close. Crash at the it back sounds here. like another crash call. But we're getting all this information from Race Radio, the Race Referees Channel. This is in French. And you can see these guys now raising the white flat. And in fact, Chalabert has gone down, number 51. So again, chaos. And there are a lot of US Postal jerseys there too. This is a big rider. Well, they've got Ekimov down nearest. And Ekimov... He's looking Armstrong. after Armstrong, Armstrong has well. gone down as well, he's not crashed but he had a slight problem here. This is number one, this is the defending champion right now, he's inside two and a half kilometres to go. Armstrong is up and riding, the race referee's car is by him. This is why the Tour de France over the first ten days is so very dangerous and precarious. There was Georgie Hincapi, but you know what, Armstrong is going to fly up through this field. He looked alright to me, there was no problem to his bike at all, and here's the last minute attack. Well, Armstrong has got to get on because uh, he'll lose time here. This race will be split time today. Look at this. U.S. Postal Service today are what being asked by Lance time. Armstrong to pull him back into the main peloton. Danilo Hondo on the front there in the white jersey. The yellow jersey, Igor Gonzalez de Galdiano was very front. There's a lot of pressure at the back because Lance Armstrong has been involved in an incident just a few moments ago. Three of those guys have been pulled back into the fold, but there's a move going off the front right now by Mapeo. Lance Armstrong apparently 15 seconds behind the main peloton at the moment. Well, this looks like uh, Pedro Jarillo is trying to slip away here for the Mape team. I might well surprise us with a surprise. Brad McGee there in second place. It is going there. The sprint has been spoiled 
here by this hill for sure at 400 meters and I think this is Pedro Harillo and if it is and it doesn't matter who it is it's a Mape rider who's going to get the sprint as he's being closed in by Bradley McGee McGee is trying to reach him he was the man that's supposed to lead out Baden Cook but he's too strong I think McGee might get his stage win here because he's closing very very quickly Pedro Harillo is beginning to crack as the sprint is starting behind now and as they kick behind it looks as though McGee is going to get the victory of his life Bradley McGee the Australian takes it on the line and what an incredible result that was well 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 Australia have got the win but by the man we didn't really expect it to he was supposed to lead out Baden Cook and he rode the field off his wheel so the yellow jersey competition which was supposed to be in hibernation until the time trial is suddenly all activity and time gaps in fact it's all on say they've got the top seven places now with Lance Armstrong slipping back to eight 34 seconds behind Igor Gonzalez de Galeano. I can't believe this is the biggest thing ever. <laughs> yeah, 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 I can't believe it. It was the biggest disappointment ever for Pedro Orio, who thought he'd timed his burst to the line perfectly. It was a deflate in the last 10 metres when he turned and saw McGee powering past him. Hombre, pues sí, yo creo que las fuerzas las tengo como para ganar una etapa, pero pero las circunstancias nunca sabes cómo son, ¿no? Y desde luego la circunstancia era favorable para mí y Y para desgracia de Oscar, pues esa caída suya pues me ha favorecido a mí, ¿no? Y, y he tratado de intentarlo. Y la verdad es que es una tengo tengo una desilusión tremenda ahora mismo porque lo he visto tan cerca que que es mejor no verlo tan cerca que para no llevarte esa desilusión. The word on Armstrong, by the way, is that he didn't actually come off in the crash, just got blocked by a teammate who did. And the word from the U.S. Postal Camp is that he'll be fit for what should be a fascinating showdown. Well, the papers, of course, are full of all of the crashes which are affecting the destiny of the riders in this race at the moment. We're losing most of the riders because of broken bones right now. This is Oscar Freire, and as you say, he's now out of the race, and that's really sad. And, of course, Lance Armstrong gets the inside page because it's the first time in four years, Paul, that he's been involved in any sort of an accident. Well, he's ridden well over the last few years, kept himself out of all kinds of incident and accident, but, in fact, he didn't properly crash yesterday. It was his teammate, Roberto Heras, who fell onto his back wheel Heras's handlebars were caught in the wheel of Armstrong. Armstrong had to put his foot on the ground, was delayed but managed to get up and started riding again. But I think uh, a little bit more scared than anything else. Yeah, well he lost 27 seconds, not a disaster, but it just shows you how easily you can lose the Tour de France. Today's stage was the third longest of the Tour, just over 217 kilometres with three fourth category climbs and like yesterday, the last of them on the run in, which was likely to make things interesting. Big crowds out for Bastille Day, and the big guns were out for the first intermediate sprint. Robbie McEwen beat Eric Zabel to it, and that cut the Germans' lead in the points competition to three. The first successful attack of the day had seven men in it, three Frenchmen, three Dutchmen, and a Latvian. That was Rives Belavoschiks. The French riders were all from different teams, Stefan Auge of Delator, Bonjour's Frank Renier, and Sebastian Eno of Credit Agricole. But it was the Dutch who made the break interesting. Rabobank's Eric Decker, who'd won stage eight in the past two tours, his young teammate Carsten Kroon, and his arch rival Cerves Carnarvon of the Domo team. As we join it, they're simultaneously trying to psych each other out and stay away from the chasing pack. Another attack, it looks like uh, it's gone uh, again. It could well be Canavan who's gone. This long, long line of people just seeing a wonderful race here and they're now a kilometre to go. To forget the race behind, they're racing now for eighth place in the peloton. Well, Frank Renier's been the aggressive man of the Tour de France so far. He's the most aggressive bike rider in the event since we left Luxembourg. There are three Dutchmen in this group right now. The leading group is seven men strong. They have thrown absolute caution to the wind this afternoon. They've launched attack after attack, and it is finally going to come down to a sprint for the line. But Milosevic is on the left-hand side. He's gone, and I think he might have hit them hard. Well, he's gone again off to the left. Decker's hooked up to his wheel. Who else would it be? Frank Rainier, the most aggressive rider of the Tour in his first Tour de France, is riding third wheel and he's looking very promising. They call him the Spider-Man. 
Well, he's got everybody in his web. Can he get them out of it? Because leading up to the line now is Velocity. Now comes Decker on the left of the picture. He's Eno now. And Eno and Decker, where is he finding the strength from? As this is going to be a tight sprint. Is it a successful day for Decker? My goodness me, no. It is Carsten Kroon, his teammate. That is an immense result. So Gonzalez de Galdiano will take a lead of 34 seconds over Armstrong into tomorrow's individual time trial, probably the most important day of his career. Sí, una cita con el destino y con la contrarreloj. Una contrarreloj importante para mí, para todo el equipo y para los adversarios también. Igor, más de medio minuto le separa de Armstrong. Eh, primera cosa, ¿usted cree que, puede, que, que usted puede ganar el contrarreloj? Segunda cosa, 37 segundos creo que le separa de Armstrong. ¿Van a ser suficientes para darle eh, el jersey amarillo en las montañas? Suficiente, no sé. Yo creo que el, yo intentaré hacer una buena contralo. El problema es que Armstrong también es muy bueno en la contralo. Incluso hasta ahora en el Tour ha sido el mejor. Tanto es una incertidumbre. Yo espero hacer la buena y a partir de ahí veremos el resultado. No hiding in the bunch today. In fact, no hiding at all. It's the individual time trial. Well, this is it. This is the bike that Lance Armstrong will use in the individual time trial, and strangely enough, it weighs in quite heavy at nine kilos. But for Armstrong, the most important thing is not weight. It's aerodynamics and rigidity. Like most of these bikes, it's made nearly all of carbon fiber, the tubes thick and flat to cut into the wind. US Postal Service even have a fin that goes right under the saddle to reduce any friction with the wind at the back end of the machine. Armstrong has opted for a full disc wheel. That way, the turbulence at the back end is reduced to a minimum. The gears he's going to use are immense, 56 or a 55 tooth chainring at the front and an 11 tooth sprocket at the back. Also at the front, he's going to have a carbon fiber wheel, but this will have very thick rims and three spokes. They've tried to make this machine as aerodynamic as possible, and even the cables here for the brakes and the gears go right inside the tubes and come out wherever necessary but it's the front end of the bike where the rider becomes more aerodynamic. He gets down onto these bars. Although these brakes don't look very good, they'll work very nicely going around the corners. But this is where aerodynamics comes to perfection, right down here in the middle. And I spoke to Chris Carmichael, Lance's coach. He told me Armstrong had been working very hard on the abs and the back to keep him in that aerodynamic position for longer. Hopefully on the long drags uphill, he will gain time over all of his rivals. Well, perhaps more decisive than the inclines on this time trial route would be the home stretch, 17 or so kilometres along the Brittany coast with the wind whipping in off the sea. The best early time of 1 hour, 2 minutes and 43 seconds was set by Hungary's Laszlo Bedrogi. When Raimundus Ramzas came up the line within metres of catching two earlier starters, it looked as though he might have beaten it, but as it turned out, he slipped into second by tenths of a second. As we join it though, Santiago Botero of Calme and Colombia is setting all the best split times. This is really beginning to warm up as the top riders come out firing on all cylinders. Huge crowd shouting them along here now as Botero is heading up now for the other check here. He should be just outside 1-2, one, 1-2-10 two, one, two, or something like that as he comes up to the line. If he's held on to all of his gains out on the course and added a couple of seconds more. He still looks very, very good here. And this is a man, king of the mountains of the Tour de France, who is now looking for a high finish in Paris as well. It is looking very good. 1-2-43 to beat, and he surely has done that. But he's not thinking of what Bedrogi has done or Rumsas. He's just afraid of what Armstrong will do behind him so he needs the best time possible here as he races up to the line well the time I thought has just gone by he too has found this last six kilometers a bit of a problem but it's still best time one two eighteen for Santiago Botero 
Well, this is the man who everyone wants to see what kind of performance he's going to put in this afternoon. Over the last nine time trials that have been at the Tour de France, Lance Armstrong has won seven of them. He's aiming for his 13th stage win in a Tour de France. If he gets it today, it certainly will be lucky for him because no cyclist currently racing has won more stages in a Tour de France. There are three riders, Cipollini, Zabo and Armstrong, all on 12 wins. Now, here's the big news. Sergei Honchar heading up towards the finish now. He was eight seconds behind the Santiago Botero with six kilometers to go. Has he kept those legs punching out this enormous pedaling gear? He certainly looks as though he's moving with some speed now. He's looking to do a time of 1-2-18 if he's going to get it, but I don't think he is, Paul. That time, I think, has slipped away. It, uh, yes, it has. It has. So Honshaw coming in at the moment. He should hang on to second best time. A little bit more of a sprint, sir, guy. You're not quite there. As he comes up to the line, it's going to be a longer one than he anticipated. 1-2-36 for the moment. Second place for the former a world time trial champion. The problem trouble on the course, Jalabert, a problem with his bike as well as his helmet. Here's the situation replayed for you. Now, Paul, is it a flat tire? I think the way he stopped it must be. Well, he's, fair, he's trying to take yep. the back wheel, but in yep. fact, it's going to take too long, and the mechanic is going to come up as quickly as possible. It looks as if he's got that stuck in there. You see, he's actually trying to unscrew that himself, and this is a very slow change for Laurent Jalabert. This is Yo. the problem with the aerodynamic bikes. The wheels and the, and the quick-release skewers have to be tightened down, and the mechanic has gone back to the car right now. This has lost Laurent Jalabert pretty close to 45 seconds right now. The spare machine is up there and running, but you know that really breaks the rhythm once something like that happens the leader of the Tour de France five days in yellow Igor Gonzalez de Galliano is now underway and Armstrong looking for a 13th stage win in a Tour de France is keeping the rhythm going over that little rise and uh, once he smells the finish he will squeeze that little bit more out of his body and Igor Gonzalez de Galdiano is still the man in yellow and he is over half distance of the time trial. So I think it's safe to assume, Paul, unless he completely cracks up, he's going to keep the race lead tonight by a few seconds, I would think, and it's going to be pretty dramatic then the first days in the mountains because we may well be looking at a huge Spanish attack. There's the clock for you to see now and counting. Lance Armstrong is very close to the first or second in the time trial. He would want it to be first as he comes up to the line now. The clock is going to tell him he is not going to win the time trial. Santiago Botero has got a great scalp here as Armstrong comes up to the line. In fact, he's conceded a little little bit more time on the approach to the line. As Armstrong comes up, he will be 10 seconds down. 1-2-29 for Armstrong. Well, at that point, the sheer drama of the day overloaded the French television circuits, and the climax of the stage was lost to the world's live broadcasters. In fact, these are the only pictures of Igor Gonzalez de Galdiano crossing the line. It didn't affect the result, though. He came in with a time of 1.02.37. Good enough for fourth and good enough to keep him in the yellow jersey. So Santiago Botero hands Lance Armstrong his first defeat in a Tour de France time trial for four years to take a dramatic stage nine win. I can't lie and say I'm not uh, disappointed with today because I am a little disappointed, but uh, anyways, here we go. Sí, bueno, la verdad es un sueño. Eso lo decía yo antes de de que pasara Lance y nada, eso te da una motivación y una alegría inmensa porque son muchos meses preparando este tour y, y bueno es muy bonito tanto para el equipo como para <laughs> Thank you, David. <laughs> es muy bonito para nosotros y bueno a Lance que, que es, está muy bien entonces más mérito aún ganarle a él y, y a igual a igual the only way to win is to take back time and the only way to take back time is to uh, it, well, there's two ways. Either they they crack and lose time, or you have a great day and attack and, and make up time. So we'll see how things go. Stage 10 here to Po was a warm-up day, really, for the big action in the Pyrenees, which begins tomorrow. Last chance for the sprinters and the breakaway merchants to grab a bit of glory before the going gets seriously diagonal. 
Po, last stop before the mountains, which meant it was the last real chance for the opportunists to stage an escape and for the sprinters to pick up any big points. 35 on offer for the stage win on a flat stage and three intermediate sprints along the way with six, four and two points for the first three riders under the banner. Well, Eric Zabel started the day just two points ahead of Robbie McEwen in the green jersey competition. And at the first sprint, McEwen beat him into second place with Stuart O'Grady a very close third. That meant McEwen and Zabel were now level on points. There was a momentary frisson on race radio when word came through that Gonzalez de Galdiano had abandoned, but it was Igor's brother Alvaro who'd been struggling with a thigh injury. There's only one Batero in the race though, and he dropped off the back early in the stage with a puncture before a couple of Calme teammates helped pace him back to the bunch. On the rest day, the great Laurent Jalabert had announced that he was quitting at the end of the season. For the second stage running, his bike decided to take early retirement. In fact, he got through three by the end of the stage. And it was a blisteringly fast stage, which was surprising for the day before the Pyrenees. Finally, after several failed efforts, a break of 11 riders, though, did manage to get away. In it was Stuart O'Grady, who took second place at the second sprint, and first place at the third. Not enough to challenge the leaders, handy points in the bag for the man who'd started the day fourth in the green jersey competition. So there's the four leaders. Good wide roads now as we course our way into Pope. That senior rival of the Tour de France on so many occasions, always giving us a great winner. And there's a move, and it's coming by Algon. Algon trying to surprise everybody. They need to respond. O'Grady's oh. waiting for somebody else. This is a dangerous thing to do. Well, somebody's got to go, and he might have done it here with eight to go because O'Grady looked and didn't react. Now they've got to sort it out. They've got time to go and recover. They've forced Dirksen to take up the chase. Interesting to note, Paul, that the Frenchman, uh, Pino, made absolutely no effort to go and chase down a Frenchman on a rival team. Watch this now. A perfect choice off the back wheel of Dirksen's, but waited till O'Grady was on the front. Dirksen was in the best position to respond and didn't. The Frenchman had no intention of responding, and the one man he feared, Stuart O'Grady, was in the right position, or in O'Grady's case, the wrong position when he put the attack in. This man is pedalling with absolute urgency, trying to survive. He stretched his advantage right now. The last time check we got was 15 seconds over the race radio. These long, slight uphill drags into the outskirts of Poe will shortly be put behind him when he comes onto the finishing place here in the Place de Verdun. As we now look at the three chasers coming under three kilometres to go, and if any, they're losing ground to Patrice Algon. The last time check for the peloton we got was four minutes and 28 seconds. And we do believe that Echeverria is still ahead of them and racing for what would be, in effect, the last place of the breakaway on the day, which would be 11th. This rider, though, is thinking of first, and he has got it all under control. 28 years of age, fairly late on, he turned pro as a roadman in 1995, and he's now going to add a win in the Tour de France. There's a few last turns before he enters the Place de Verdun, and that'll be for him the end of today's stage of the tour but this is going to be his victory now uh, Patrice Algon is sprinting for the first French win of this year's Tour de France he read it well and he deserves it because he made the attack that shaped the final four-man escape on the last climb of the Côte d'Oja he won all of the climbs today he's gone second in the King of the Mountains he doesn't matter about that he is the winner of the stage in Po, and the first Frenchman to do it. Now O'Grady could do his second place, but they're letting the youngest Frenchman get the lead here. Frank Pino at 22 years of age. The French can't go wrong today. It's going to be a one-two, Paul. As uh, Frank Pino now, the young man, he's looking over his shoulder. He doesn't believe it. He's annoyed because he isn't winning, but he can't believe he's finished second. And if you're wondering why Stuart O'Grady didn't respond to Algon's attack, well, well, here's his answer. You ever ridden a road race? Legs are burning, everyone's the same, you know. Um, the first one to attack is always going to take the edge off the other ones, and uh, straight away, you know, you go, you go into negative thinking. And I was trying to get the guys to, to really pull along, and uh, that's racing, eh?
Well, this is going to be a very, very tight sprint indeed. Men are moving all over the road here. On the left of our picture now, Brad McGee has swung off as Baden Cook starts to go for the line now. Zarbel is coming too. Robbie McEwen is onto Zarbel's wheel. This is going to be touch and go here, but I think Baden Cook, no. McEwen on the line, very, very close. He might well have got two places over Zarbel, Paul, but there's no doubt about one thing. Uh, the Australian McEwen, for the first time, has got the green jersey for himself today. It was a good day for O'Grady, up into third in the points competition too. But a better one for his Aussie rival, Robbie McEwen, who now leads the green jersey race by a single point from Eric Zabel. This is what I've been working for the last few days. And, uh, you know, I was a few days ago, about four days ago, I was, I was virtual green on the road. And then at the finish, I you know, lost a few points um, through finishing third when Eric won. And it took me another four days after that to get back on level terms. Now, I knew I had to beat him here at the finish, and I was able to do that and take a one-point lead. So uh, it's an honour to be able to wear the green jersey in the Tour, and now we hit the mountains and the fun starts. Today marked the start of the Tour Mark II, as the race hit the Pyrenees in the certain knowledge that the Pyrenees would retaliate. Stage 11 would be the first big test for the men chasing Lance Armstrong's title, and of course, for Armstrong himself. You know, there aren't many races that are improved by being slowed down. As a general rule in sport, faster is better. In cycling, though, suffering beats speed, and nothing produces more suffering and more spectacle than the Alps and the Pyrenees, which is where we are today. Now, of course, the strongest man in the mountains the past three years has been the strongest man overall, Lance Armstrong. And he didn't get that way just by eating his shredded wheat. While most riders are just getting out of winter training and into their first races of the year, Lance Armstrong is already riding the Tour, or at least what he considers to be the key stages of it. By the time the race starts for real, he'll have ridden climbs like today's maybe half a dozen times. God help anything that gets in his way, whether it's an avalanche or the advice of his team manager. Lance, we're going with the car to, uh, until where you can ride, to prepare your clothes and some tea and stuff. Okay. Okay? What if I keep going? You can't. Huh? You cannot. Three meters of snow. The guy says you can. There's no way you can ride. There's no way. Who says that? It's, in my opinion, essential to know the courses, and not just to be able to say yes, I know what the Ventoux looks like, or yes, I know what La Mangie or Plateau de Bay or La Plagne looks like, because I've done it before. I did. Oh, we did it in the Tour in '93. I was there. I did it. <clears throat> It's not the same. The approaches are different. The roads have changed. You know, the climbs you do before are most likely not in the same order that you did them in '93. Uh, so it's important to go and see it exactly the way it is. And then, second of all, and maybe even more importantly, is it's fantastic training to spend four or five days there with such climbing uh, and such hard days. In my opinion, is 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 one way to improve. No rider in history has prepared for the Tour with Armstrong's zeal and attention to detail, and the benefits can obviously be seen on the podium in Paris. But once you realise what he's doing, they're noticeable on the road too. When Armstrong attacks, like he attacked Jan Ulrich on Alpe d'Huez last year, it's in the knowledge of exactly where he is on the stage and what difficulties lie between him and the finish line. Not to diminish Armstrong's natural talent, but it's that kind of knowledge that can make the difference between winning and losing, and there's only one way to acquire it. I think I want to ride a little more, you know? Why don't you do another uh, 10 kilometers of uphill? I'll go down 10k and come back. Pay attention, eh? 10k. That's what it takes to win the tour. Why? Training in this weather. Nobody sees that. We were about to see the results of it, though, on a route that took the riders over the second most climbed mountain in Tour history, the Col d'Obisque, and finished partway up the most climbed of the lot, the Tourmalet. Along the way, just two green jersey sprints for any sprinters who still had the legs to take them on. The first attack came early, 13 kilometres, and in the break was Laurent Jalabert, who quickly left the others behind to ride over the Col d'Obisque on his own. It looked very reminiscent of a stage in the Pyrenees last year when Jalabert made an heroic break 
only to be overhauled by Lance Armstrong on the way to Plada Day. Of course, Lance is too businesslike to believe in omens, but nonetheless, it was Postal doing all the work at the front of a medium-sized chasing group that also contained the yellow jersey and his other big rivals. Telecom were doing some chasing too, with Robbie McEwen struggling at the back. They were hoping to keep their man Eric Zabel at the front for just long enough to get some points at the second sprint of the day. Having gone up the Col d'Obisc and the Col de Sulor, a couple of riders came down heavily. Jens Voigt of Credit Agricole and the winner of Stage 7, Bradley McGee, who'd left a couple of sponsors' logos on the tarmac in exchange for some nasty-looking road burn. As we join the action, Jalabert is still out front and hoping to avoid a rerun of last year's Pyrenean adventure. Well, Jalabert riding hopefully to a stage win, if not the race lead, because that's gone, I think, for him. That wasn't his main intention of the day. It was, in, of course, to get a uh, stage win, and also, by virtue of the fact he's ahead and gets maximum points at the finish, he would also be pulling on the jersey as leader of the King of the Mountains. A beautiful sunny day, a lone leader in the Tour de France. The latest gap is 3 minutes and 19 seconds for the rider out front. Laurent Jalabert has held them without gaining or losing a second for so many kilometres now and he still looks as though he's struggling but let's hope that he will make it up that valley there to at least uh, the finishing line which today thankfully I would suggest now for Laurent Jalabert is only uh, two-thirds of the way up the Col de Tourmalet. I'll tell you what, that is a beautiful backdrop, Phil, and one that I used to get very scared of when I was a bike rider, because when you saw the mountain starting to close around you, you knew there was only one way out, and that was up, and that's what all of these bike riders are thinking about right now. For Lance Armstrong, after the, the individual time trial a couple of days ago, this is his first real rendezvous at the Tour de France. He's laid his foundations for victory over the last three years in the mountains more than anywhere else, and it's nearly always been on the first day in the mountains. I I think that tactic may change today because I have a feeling Armstrong will wait for tomorrow's stage which is a lot longer with a lot more repetition of climbing to do but the one man who wants to stay as close to possible to him is there in the yellow jersey is Igor Gonzalez de Galdiano at the start of the day they were separated by 26 seconds well, we're looking at Laurent Jalabert, this wonderful cyclist from France who's ridden so well today. He's such a brilliant, aggressive bike rider. I'm not sure he can hang on to the finishing line. We all hope he can. Looking now, he's at 3 minutes 11 seconds. He is 20 kilometres or 12 miles from the finishing line. So, so close and it's a desperate moment. 3 minutes 15 seconds for Laurent Jalabert looking better I think now than he was about 15 miles ago well this is the valley of Campon and the beautiful little town of Santa Marie de Campon has its place in the annals of the Tour de France it was here in 1913 uh, when uh, Eugene Christophe came off the mountain ready to climb up the next one had broken his forks and in the local forge he asked somebody to work the bellows while he repaired his own bicycle forks and to get any assistance in those days was not allowed. He was disqualified from the tour when he was the leader. And uh, in the fact, the forge is now part of a museum in that town. That's an incredible story, but this is the area where the history and the legends of the Tour de France have always been made. The mountains are so dramatic. They're dramatic as a backdrop, and they're also dramatic as a racing terrain, as Laurent Jalabert knows so well. He's raced well in the Pyrenees in the past, and last year did a similar escapade to this through the Pyrenees and tried to get himself the win at the top of the summit of the Plata Day. But unfortunately, he... Uh, he wasn't able to do anything against the return to the top of Lance Armstrong on that day. And 20 kilometres to go for the US postal led peloton containing the Mayo Jaune. And the stars of Kelme are here too, by the way, Batero and Sevilla. There's little Sevilla. Babyface himself, Christophe Moreau, nearest camera in the green. Behind him is Bobby Julik, who looking good today, Bobby. The sun is now uh, coming off the right shoulder of this great French rider, Laurent Jalabert. The gap, 3 minutes 25 seconds, he's pushing it out again. This man never knows the words, give up. He will fight to the end. 
Well, he's around about four kilometers now from the real start of the final climb of the day. The final climb of the day is 12.8 kilometers. The average gradient only works out at 7%, but the, I think as we get closer to the summit is where it is its steepest part, and there the average gradient is 10%, and that's where it will really start to kick in and the pain will start to appear in the riders' minds. This is the lovely town now of Santa Marie de Campon where Eugene Christophe once snapped his forks and was then disqualified because he got somebody to work the bellows while he forged a new pair. That's not justice, but that was in 1913. The rules were different then. Well, the rules were different then. These men have uh, cars that follow behind to change their machines, and it's a much slicker organisation that the teams have than the, the early teams when riders used to sleep at the side of the road. And there's some great stories, if you ever want to read the history of the Tour de France, of, of men actually being uh, kidnapped to try and stop them winning the Tour de France and being set upon in the night as they tried to ride through the mountain passes. None of that goes on now, I don't think. So Laurent Jalabert now has only one thing on his mind, that's the climb which is directly ahead of him. He is holding and slightly gaining. Three minutes, 20 seconds. So he just keeps it in that five second window. These boys keep the steady tempo going. Rubiera, number nine there, the big rider from Spain, all now ready to ride alongside Lance Armstrong. Little rush of Rabobank riders there because Levi Leipheimer is here and looking good, so he may have informed the riders to put him in a good position as they start the assault on the finishing climb. Igor Gonzalez de Galdiano and his teammate Yoshiva Balocchi is down there side by side. Uh, balocchi has been off, he's on a different bike in fact, he changed his bike in the end and you can see he's got no number on his frame now. So he's got rid of all his problems he hopes for the day. His only problem now, where's number one in this race, Lance Armstrong. Just 10 kilometres to go. This is an heroic performance today. Well, he hasn't lost anything at all, and this is really very impressive, because bear in mind, this man, Phil, was attacking after just 15 kilometres of racing today. As soon as the race came out of the blocks, Jalabert was looking for the move. He's equipped his bike with very special wheels today. They're aerodynamic wheels. These wheels were put on for a special reason. The reason was he wanted to get himself off the front and try and do a special exploit in the Pyrenees for what is possibly his last attempt at the Tour de France because he's told the world that he will retire at the end of this year and he's doing a great ride and still holding on. I'm sure the accelerations must come, but they won't come, I don't think, until we get to the steeper part of the climb. Right, because at the moment, you may have noticed Jalabert still had his chain on the big chain wheel, pedalling a heavy gear indeed, and not, uh, not the sort of gear that he will pedal very, very shortly. Here is Zabel, inspired ride today. He's dropping off the back now with Aldag, joined Bab Magri, Christophe Monjean, Patrice Algon. They're all off the back. And uh, now, as it gets really, really tough, and uh, Louis, uh, Ladslo Bodrogi was the other Mape rider there, who was part of the original escape earlier on. They've all called it quits on the climb now. They've stepped aside as the big players have started to turn the screw that little bit tighter. And it's the boys of US Postal who are mounting the pace. Still over three minutes for Jalabert. Three minutes, ten seconds. He can tick the kilometres off now. He's in single digits. Unfortunately, the last six kilometres are at one in ten or ten percent. That's painful. That is hard. Laurent Jalabert has got to do something very special to survive today, Phil, because he's been on the attack for over 130 kilometres. The shoulder's just rocking a little bit, and this is Laurent Brochard here. Well, I never saw him come back into the race. He was dropped on the obese. He must have done. Uh, but now I think he's going back again from the leading group. So he did a fair ride to get back into a position uh, to even be left behind by the peloton today. Looking down at the selection being made here now, a lot of riders have dropped away off the tail of this group, including, unfortunately, Bradley McGee. He wouldn't have been dropped if he hadn't have been injured on the descent of the fall of the con, uh, the descent rather, after a fall on the Col de Soulor. And another rider going off the back here, looks as though it's Michael Bogarts. So he's gone, and this is David Miller, so he was in there, but sadly, the first time we see him, he is losing contact from the bunch. Well, he's having a hard time. It must be difficult to keep hold of the handlebars with that 
rib, rib that's giving him a lot of pain, a, a problem with his intercostal muscles, and when you get into a big race like the Tour de France, no extra pain is required at all, and it's a pity to see that David Miller is going off the back there. He had said to us before the start of the Tour de France that he had lost a bit of his time trialling ability, Phil, because he'd speci specially trained for the big mountain stages. On the first day of the mountains, he's losing contact with the Lance Armstrong group. Yes, and not a big group, not just a selection of a handful of riders, which doesn't all well, perhaps, what we'll see and hope. As we now see Jalabur continuing, he's still holding a three-minute advantage. He, the bunch, had just gone under that 10-kilometre banner, six miles, as he is still about a kilometre and a half, probably a full mile ahead on the road. The Spanish supporters here, here to cheer on their men, still saving something for this wonderful Frenchman. He's suffering now like he's probably, well, I won't say like he's never suffered before because he always tries to, his, to the top of his ability. He knows what it's like to suffer. He's been through this so many times in a 14-year career, turning professional back in 1989. Four stage victories in the Tour de France, and most of those have been on the flat days. Two times he's won himself the stage on the 14th of July, Bastille Day, but this would be a great victory for him if he can hold them off today. I don't think US Postal Service, Phil, are actually trying to pull him back. They're just setting a nice steady tempo on the front. Armstrong, I feel his tactics are he's waiting to see what the others are going to do on this first day in the mountains. I couldn't agree more, and Armstrong's team have been the team of the day. They've controlled this race from the start. They've kept the race leader on the defensive, looking for a way out of the box in which they've placed him. And while up here, this man isn't going to be the race leader by the end of the day, but with a small time gap, let's hope he can hang on to take the honours, uh, because he's certainly been the man who deserves them today. Laurent Jalabert was the highest placed Frenchman, I think he still is the highest placed Frenchman overall. Starting the day, 4 minutes and 18 seconds down. If he can finish one and a half uh, minutes ahead, he'd be in the top five riders in the Tour anyway. Well, the French have a good word to describe this kind of bike rider, the man we've been looking at for most of the afternoon, Laurent Jalabert. They call him a guerrier which means a warrior, and he certainly is a warrior of the Tour de France because he's gone out on the attack on so many occasions. We're now looking at Lance's men. That was Rubiera just going through. Armstrong still looking calm and collected. Roberto Heras is just behind him. Heras, a former winner of the Tour of Spain. He actually has had a serious problem with his calf over the last few days. The man who wears the yellow jersey must be wondering exactly what is going to happen. Levi Leipheimer third overall in the Tour of Spain last year, the leader of the Rabobank squad right now, and formerly he used to ride alongside the men in blue because he raced for US Postal last year. There was no place for him in the team this year because he has become a leader in his own right after that brilliant ride in the Tour of Spain last year. Now it's his first time in the Tour de France and this a big test day for him. Back to the man who just wants to survive and get it over with. He's an old hand in the Tour de France. He's had the coloured jerseys, every one of them on his shoulders at some time or another. And the two, he's kept all the way to Paris, the King of the Mountains and the green jersey as best sprinter. There aren't many cyclists in the world ever won the two extremes of the competitions. Definitely not, but this man has uh, done that and he's also won himself the Tour of Spain as well and he's won so many stages in that unbelievable bike race and he's been able to win himself different kinds of races from the very start of the season in February right the way through to the end of the year. George Hincapi doing a superb job today as he keeps the pace up at the front, being followed here by Rubiera. And then Harass, the little climbers now, look how lithe they are there. They just need to dance on the pedals when they get out of the saddle. They've got no excess body weight whatsoever. As we now see other riders moving up. And one we should watch out for, Paul. He crashed out last year when he broke his collarbone. Is Ivan Basso. Well, he's in the white jersey there for Faso Bortolo, just on the right-hand side. This is happening at the rear there is Yatislav Ekimov. He's done his job for the day. He's slipping away from the main contenders, as is Emmanuel Magnan. And it's surprising to see him so close to the front of a stage, a mountain stage of the Tour de France. But he was one of the men who went out on the early attack with Laurent Jalabert when they formed a group of 11 men that went off the front. And after that, he survived and managed to stay in contact with the leading group. But right now, we are looking down at this group, which is slowly but surely reducing itself in numbers. And here's the first attack of the day, the first attack from the yellow jersey group. 
Yes, and it wouldn't surprise me. Uh, it is, in fact, uh, it's not Agnoluto, it's one of his teammates, though, from Jean de la Tour, who's launched the attack. And this could be an interesting move. It could well be Laurent Lefebvre who's gone clear here. As they start the moves now, they won't react to him. Lefebvre is on his way. You can see how US Postal have certainly not responded at all to that attack coming out of the front. They're not worried about these lesser riders moving off the front. They are waiting to see if the attacks will come from Santiago Botero or Oscar Sevilla or even Roberto Lysseca. I don't think, in fact, Armstrong wants to set a hard tempo to, in fact, pull back the Frenchman Laurent Jalabert. He will be looking at the men who stand a serious chance of beating him in the overall classification. Laurent Lefebvre off the front there for Jean de la Tour. But you can see there's no panic at all in the main group. They're not worried. And Georgie Hincapi oh. swings off there. The job's been done. It's a question now of just trying to get his huge carcass up to the summit. Well, he'll hang on well. David Etchbury has just been dropped from the peloton after his attacks earlier on today. He was second over the Col d'Orbisque. Laurent Lefebvre will keep it, uh, the job in hand, try and get away from them. They won't directly chase him down. He's not a future winner of the Tour de France this year. But Armstrong sent up Rubiera now to lift the pace. And there he is down there. It's beginning to get a little select group at the head of the bunch. Also down there too is uh, Andrei Kivalev as uh, Rubiera is setting the pace. This is back to the front now. As we see, Laurent Jalabert look over his shoulder, trying to stay away, still looking very good. That face doesn't often give the game away. I thought he was uh, telling us earlier he was finished, uh, but now he's OK. This is David Echebrea, he's been dropped and is uh, trying to pick his way through groups. And George Hincapi going off on the right. I think uh, caught a glimpse there too, sadly, of Bobby Julik going off the back. There he Telecom is, Julik yeah. just in front. Well, Julik was hoping to ride well in this year's Tour de France and uh, once again in the mountains, having a hard time following the tempo set on the front by his former teammates. Michael Bogart going out of the back for the second time and probably the last time. Dario Frigo as well going off the back right now. Ouch. This is when it's really starting to get grippy. You see here one or two Onse riders coming off the back as well. Jorg Yaks, who's done a lot of work for the team earlier on. He's been off the back looking after his teammate Yoshiba Biloki. Now this is a bit of a surprise. This is, this is Menchoff, the leader of Ibanesto.com. He's also cracked as we speak now. Andrei Kivalev, fourth last year, is still in this. I see Laurent Lefebvre has been picked up. He's on the right of our picture. This, uh, what have we got? Maybe 15, 20 very select riders now. And Levi Leipheimer is still there on the left of our picture with the balding pate. 2.25 is the gap now to Laurent Jalabert. I feel inclined to cheer for Jalabert right now because we'd love him to win. He deserves to win after attacking from the very start. In fact, he's only 5.9 kilometers from the finish. The tempo on the front there is being done by Lance Armstrong's faithful lieutenant there, Chechu Rubiera. Rubiera setting a very nice pace on the front. No problem at all for Armstrong. He doesn't seem to be worried about pulling back Laurent Jalabert. Yoshiba Baloki is on his tail. The yellow jersey still in very fine contact in fourth place. Igor Gonzalez de Galeano. They are all there for the moment. All of the big names are there, but it seems as if Fro uh, Christophe Moreau is going to the back. The green jersey of Credit Agricole in a bit of serious difficulty. Well, pacemaking being done by postal Spanish riders here are stretching at this group and to an awful long line now. Looking down at the group there, the yellow jersey still marking his man and Balocchi on his shoulder. As we see now, the two Spanish riders lining up behind Lance Armstrong. It looks now like the end of Francis Moreau here. He's also been dropped by the group. And also going off is Zabeldia of Uscatel Escardi. They'll get back up to the leaders very shortly, but they are thinning out rather rapidly just at the moment. David Miller sadly has gone as well. He was in the group. He's been dropped. And if Ivan Basso, still in the group, gets more than two minutes, he'll be the next candidate for the leader's white jersey. Well, going out of the back, this is Jose Javier Gomez from Kelme. Also going out of the back was the, the Russian leader of AG2R, Bocharov. 
So some big names going out of the back. That's a very prized souvenir. Armstrong taking off his hat and throwing it into the crowd. Now, that'll be worth a few bob in a couple of years' time. Well, we're now hearing that Tyler Hamilton has cracked as well and is being left. We might get a shot of that. Also, Richard Veronk is in trouble. So the pace that's being set by the US Postal Domestics here from Spain is crippling the rest of the race. But it's noted, Paul, that the two riders from Spain who said they're going to give trouble to Armstrong are still riding right at the front. They're still there and they're still waiting for an opportunity. Roberto Laiseca did not look very comfortable either just a few moments ago. He would be the big hope for the crowd here who are resplendent in their orange jerseys and shirts. And they were hoping that it was going to be the day for Uscatel Uscadi. You can see the Basque flag at the side of the road there. But I think the majority of the crowd here are willing this man on to win because this man has done an unbelievable exploit today. Well, there's a puncture and it sounds like Patero has got a problem in this group. We might see him, but I believe he is stopped by the roadside. We're looking for him as we see Moreau here fight his way back up to the tail of this group. We, we uh, will look for him on the right, I think, as we go through. There's the car stopped. Now, he must be under, sh under shadow of the car, I think. But it's certainly trouble for Botero, Paul, as we now see this rider press on relentless. Another kilometre ticked off as the Spanish people here cheering on a Frenchman. Well, that's a tough move there for Botero to try and pull himself back into the race. Richard Virenk also in difficulty right now. If we look down there, you can see there in the group is Sevilla. We're looking further back and there's the yellow jersey. The yellow jersey has cracked and he is slipping away from the lead. Look at the face on Sevilla. They need to stay in this group. Armstrong talking to his troops there, Phil. He's egging them on, he's encouraging them. He's telling them exactly what tempo to set. Well, wait for it. In the next three minutes, uh, Lance Armstrong will be in the Mayo Jean of the Tour de France. Igor Gonzalez de Galdiano started the day 26 seconds ahead and he's losing it fast with, surprisingly, uh, Francisco Mansabo is in that group as well. As well, Manolo Sainz always said his man was on the left there, Balocchi, and Balocchi is still riding. Uh, but they're slowly becoming outnumbered. A great ride being done as well uh, by Andrei Kivilev of Kazakhstan. Still in there. He's still in there, still surviving. Manthebo is here. The yellow jersey has to survive. Now it's Roberto Heras. Heras has come to the front. This man is the big mate of Lance Armstrong. His teammates have done an unbelievable job at five kilometers to go. Leipheimer is no longer there. They're five kilometers to go to the summit. Andrei Kivilev looks as if he's going to crack now. The confidence rider on the left hand side Roberto Heras is lifting up the pace for Armstrong who slowly but surely is riding his way towards the yellow jersey and this is destruction time now only one rider is left one rider on Anse versus what's left of US Postal this is a show of defiance now but Lockie is hanging on to the coattails of Armstrong as Roberto Heras is just lifting the pace too much for everyone except two men so it's one on one, Paul, and Balocchi is the only man able to hang on to Armstrong. Well, it looks like the Anse Armada is crumbling. There is Levi Leipheimer, the leader of the Rabobank team. He can see the yellow jersey, Igor Gonzalez de Galdiano. Gonzalez de Galdiano knows that his chances are slipping away this afternoon. And Manolo Sainz was right to assume that Yoshiba Balocchi should be the lone leader. Just for the, the record book, this man at five kilometers to go had a one minute and 20 seconds advantage over this chasing group of Armstrong, Heras and Yoshiba Balocchi. Armstrong, though, has got an unbelievable team of climbers. What a brilliant job done by Chechu Rubiera and then taken over by Roberto Heras. He's got a huge bandage on his right calf muscle there, but he's riding a great tempo for Lance today. They are now just 56 seconds down on Laurent Gelabert, and even Belocchi looks to be having some difficulty to stay on the tail wheel there of Armstrong. The first day in the mountains, and Armstrong is all over this race again. Less than a minute now to catching Laurent Jalabert. I don't think he can survive, but at least the three coming up are not going to wipe him out of the leaderboard entirely. He surely can hang on to something on this great day of racing. Armstrong checking in there with Brunel. To, I think he probably wants to know where's the yellow jersey right now, as Heras does all of the work for his teammates, allowing Armstrong the option here to sprint clear when he wants to. He is riding this event so cool. He is very cool, talking to Johan Brunil all the time. Brunil talking to his 
man slowly but surely explaining just exactly what the gap is right now all Igor Gonzalez de Galdiano can do is ride his personal time trial to the finish and hope that he can serve 26 seconds I don't think he will right now Laurent Jalabert is hoping that he can conserve the remainder of his advantage which is down to 38 seconds it's such a pity for this man he's put in a brilliant battle today and he's going to go through exactly the same scenario as he went through on the Plata day last year he's going to see Lance Armstrong coming forward this time not alone but this time he will be with Roberto Harris and Yoshiba Bilocchi they're pulling all of the cars out of the gap right now because on his tail is Lance Armstrong they are there they can see this man at four kilometers Armstrong Bilocchi looks as though he's under pressure but he's hanging on Harass takes a good look at the man from his own country here as he pulls an American to the lead in the Tour de France inside four kilometers now down the gap is 26 seconds this man looks here as though he's just gone through the shower as the perspiration tumbles off his face Igor Gonzalez de Galliano with the other American Levi Leipheimer right behind him they're going to be still high on the overall classification but they are going to be scared so much of what will come tomorrow from this man, Lance Armstrong. I've never seen a man chat so much with his team manager at a situation like this. At the moment, he's calm and collected. He's just riding a very sensible race. He's using his teammate. And this year, Roberto Harris is going to be absolutely superb. Last year, he had a hard time coming through the mountains. He was plagued by a tendonitis. But this year, we are looking at a very good and strong Roberto Harris. He is going to be a huge ally for Lance Armstrong in the mountains. Jalabert looks over his shoulders he knows what is happening right now and he has taken a serious blow to his morale he thought for a few moments I think he was going to win this stage he's got himself a lot of points in the King of the Mountains competition but he was hoping to win the first Pyrenean stage of this year's Tour de France well as they approach him the yellow jersey is now a full minute a full minute behind Lance Armstrong Bellocchi and Harass and so Bellocchi who started a minute 23 behind his teammate is now climbing into second place in the Tour de France Armstrong undoubtedly clear for yellow when you crack on a climb like this you blow to absolute smithereens and that's exactly what's happened to Igor Gonzalez de Galdiano he has worn the yellow jersey now Phil since the team time trial the pressure of wearing this the yellow jersey on your shoulders is unbelievable the press want to talk to you every day you can't sleep at night and right now it has been taken away from his shoulders they have now caught Laurent Jalabert there are four riders at the front of the race I wonder if Laurent Jalabert has got enough left in his body just to try and stay with Armstrong Heras is setting the tempo there there's a lone star flag at the side of the road and Armstrong quite content Phil just to sit there and let Heras do the pacemaking there is nothing to gain at the moment for Bellocchi even attempting to attack Armstrong even if he can Levi Leipheimer being tailed by the Mayo Jean group here which is still uh, gathering strength as riders join Igor Gonzalez de Galeana but now timed at 1 minute 10 seconds Eva uh, Kivilev is the rider on the left of our picture there and rider number 31 is Oscar Sevilla but Patero has not recovered from that problem he had down the road most unfortunate for the Colombian and Jalabert has also cracked let's hope he can hang on for fourth place look at his face that really tells a picture he thought for a few moments he could hang on to the train of Armstrong Heras and Sevilla he couldn't do that but this man was attacking from the very few first kilometers of today's stage Roberto Heras on the front is doing the superb job for Lance Armstrong pacing him up this climb Armstrong has built himself a magnificent team for the Tour de France his team when they first came to the tour were criticized for not being strong right now I think they've got the advantage over Onse who thought they were the strongest team on block to take on the Texan well it has been a demonstration beyond belief here we've always thought Armstrong was riding a calculated tour now he's proved it he's still riding a calculated tour he's riding under instructions from his manager not wasting his energy he doesn't need to apply any more pressure he may never go to the front today except to win the stage because he's let his team gain all the time for him 
and now this man Heras has been worth his weight in gold. They're saying that the group Mayo Jean, well, it's coming back. It was 110, it's now 49 seconds, so it may be clawing its way back. Armstrong is conserving energy here as best he can for the big day tomorrow. Well, another time check coming in off race radio, 57 seconds. I think I'm more inclined to believe Me the 57 too. seconds because this man is going backwards. There's no way looking at him, he is coming forward to the group of Armstrong. Armstrong's group looks strong. Look at the face. This man thought he could hold on to Armstrong maybe for one more day, but he's having to relinquish leadership of his team to Yoshiba Balocchi, who is just managing to survive here with Lance Armstrong and Roberto Heras. But even Balocchi seems to be having a hard time staying on the wheel of the man setting an unbelievable pace on the front, Roberto Heras wearing number three. Two to one the odds now, two US Postals against the Onse rider. He's hopelessly outnumbered here, Armstrong hasn't used any of his energy yet in making the pace up this climb. It would not surprise me though if Bilocchi tries one cheeky attack just to try and steal the stage for a psychological result, but somehow I can't see Lance allowing it. I don't think I want to get Lance very angry at this stage of the game, and I think if we were to launch an attack, we would see a huge violent counter-attack coming for Armstrong. For the moment, he is quite content to ride along in the slipstream of his teammate. He may well even try and offer the victory to his teammate at the end of the day, but the most important thing for these guys is for the victory to be in the US postal camp. But Loki is sitting there, and he has not put any ability at all to attack. He's quite happy to be there. The American flags are mixing it in with the Basque flag at the side of the road and it looks as if Bilocchi is having a hard time for actually staying on the wheel of the two men from the US Postal Service team. Joe Lance on the torso of that man that just ran past. It's pick your, pick your hero and choose here because America's being knocked out by the supporters of Bilocchi as they run alongside him. So it's Spain and America as we race across French roads and this is a tremendous atmosphere here at the Tour de France. And this poor man, Laurent Jalabert, steadily going back. He's 10 seconds back as we speak, but still riding this mountain in fourth place. Well, this is what happens when the lights go out. Poor old Laurent Jalabert. He was riding on morale before. He still felt that he had the possibility of a win. And once you realize that you are no longer going to win, all the lights and sound goes out completely. This is the group of the second heads of state of the Tour de France this year. Raimundas Rumsas is in the blue and pink for Lamprey on the front there. The yellow jersey, Igor Gonzalez de Galdiano. In there as well is Jose Acevedo for Onse. It's the team of the men who are going to be the second place runners, I think, in this year's Tour de France because US Postal Service may well be climbing well up in the overall standings and Roberto Heras is doing himself a pretty nice job as well today. 64 seconds the gap now. It'll be one and a half before we get to the summit. I'm sure of that as this rider, Roberto Heras, is just storming up this mountain for Armstrong who still doesn't look as though he's made any effort whatsoever. Underneath the canopies now, as we approach the village of La Mangie, these canopies to stop the rock slides and the snow in the winter, to keep them off the road, as these riders now go through a corridor of orange shirts of the people from the Basque area of Spain, all shouting for the man in pink, while it's the man in blue who is the coolest operator on the tour this day. Well, right now they're into the barriers. This is the safest part of the course. Right now, a few moments ago, it was just a corridor of people and noise for Armstrong, Heras and Yoshiba Bilocchi. This is Laurent Jalabert. By the way, he's around about 51 seconds behind. Ivan Basso, in fact, counter-attacked the yellow jersey group a few moments ago, and he has caught Jalabert. He is in fourth place on the road. And this is the next white jersey after David Miller, I think, in the tour. This is another superb performance, but it's all being acted behind at the real centre stage. Here it is. That I, I, I suppose you noticed then uh, that was a terrific acceleration that came from Heras. I thought he cracked Bolocki, but Bolocki has come back on. Armstrong, uh, well, not under pressure, he's still waiting. He's waiting to see the banner, I think, for the finish, and then I expect him to shoot away. Now, where does Laurent Jalabert find these legs from? He's hung on to Basso, and he's hanging on to fifth place on the stage. This is the group behind of the Mayo Jean. He's lost the lead now as we head up with the leaders inside one kilometre to go as we come up towards that kite. 68 seconds to the Mayo Jean. Now, Paul, where does Lance launch the finishing attack? 
Well, I think he's going to wait until the very last moment. He said he didn't want to do anything dramatic today. He just wanted to see how everybody else reacted. The attacks never came from the climbers on the first day in the mountains. Men like Roberto Liseca were in serious difficulty. The most unfortunate man there really is Santiago Botero, who had a crash. He had a puncture at the side of the road there. But right now, the answer is, I think Armstrong will wait until the last four or 500 meters. Gonzalez de Galdiano in serious difficulty now. He can't stay with the other contenders and Acevedo staying alongside him, trying to keep him in a top five position. Seven days in yellow, it's all but a dream now for Igor Gonzalez de Galeano. As we see, the only man likely to challenge Armstrong now, Joshiba Balocchi hanging on. It's sad when you see the Mayo Jean in trouble, but he's had a good run for his money. He was always seen as the man who one day would lose that yellow jersey. As we see now, Jalabert being swept up by this rather large group of riders. Jalabert has gone to the limit today, and I don't think uh, there's anything more left in the tank. Back to Roberto Heras, still dragging his captain to the summit, and Balocchi still hanging on to the express. Well, this has been an unbelievable piece of teamwork by Roberto Harris in first position there right now. And Armstrong so far has not had to make an effort himself at all. He has a brilliant team here at the Tour de France. All nine riders are still there and intact. He now is counting on one of the best climbers in the world, Roberto Harris, a winner of the Vuelta a España. He now is just pacing Armstrong up to the finish. Armstrong looks oh, across oh, the road oh. to force Belocchi to come to the front. They want to make sure they don't get caught out by a last-minute attack by the Spaniards. Sorry a little bit about the pictures there, but we're back to normal now. Armstrong is just manoeuvring Balocchi into number two position to ride him out of the race in the race for first place. He has watched Balocchi all day long. He's moved over, made him go second, up behind Heras, and he's waiting till he sees the moment to attack, and he's going to win by two seconds. He's going to wait and see if Belocchi attacks first, but there is the time to the Mayo Jaune. The yellow jersey at the start of the day is a minute and 23 seconds behind right now. Exactly what Belocchi was behind the Mayo Jaune this morning, a minute and 23. So Belocchi climbs to second overall in the Tour de France, but he is still going to be a minute 23 behind the new leader, I would think. Uh, sorry, a few seconds behind the new leader, Lance Armstrong. Now, in sight of the line, Belocchi still thinking of a win here. He's still proud enough to say, look, this is a finish in front of Spanish people, and he's going to give it his best shot. Harass, I think Armstrong would have given this stage to Harass if only the other man wasn't there. He would love to give this victory to Roberto Harass, but that's not the scenario. Obviously, Yoshiba Belocchi didn't read the script at the start of the day, and this is the move by Armstrong. He's going for the win. Well, he's dug deep. He looks over his shoulder. There's really not a strong enough reaction from Belocchi. Belocchi. Belocchi is desperate here, but what a good fight he has put up. But now it's all, everything he's got unleashed in those legs. And this is now his 13th stage win in a Tour de France, more than any other current cyclist on the circuit. Armstrong wins the day, claims again another first on the first day in the mountains, and awaiting for him the Golden Fleece. He's the new leader of the Tour. But it was hard. Look how hard it was for Belocchi over the last 50 meters. He is cracked, I think, more psychologically than anything else. This man waited till the last possible moment. His teammate Roberto Heras will have crossed the line in third position. But the yellow jersey today has completely and utterly crumbled at the side of the road. As we look here at the power of Lance Armstrong, the only time I think he seriously turned a pedal in anger was in the last 100 meters today. His team won the stage for him. Lance just finished it off in the best possible tradition. Well, a finish that was supposed to be easy has certainly caused some serious time differences. And Armstrong didn't really race as hard as he could have done, I think. This is Andrei Kivileva, and the yellow jersey is in the finishing straight right now with Laurent Jalabert, Jose Acevedo, and Igor Gonzalez de Galeano. Last year's fourth place finisher, over a minute and a half behind on the climb. A great, great cheer for Jalabert as he comes in at a minute 47. And the yellow jersey has conceded virtually two minutes as he crosses the line today. And as you can see from the caption, Lance Armstrong took seven seconds off Yaseba Balocchi in the space of about 40 metres at the finish line. He was second ahead of Roberto Eras, who did all the pacemaking. Ivan Basso, the young Italian rider, climbed impressively to finish seventh, with Igor Gonzalez de Galdiano 11th, losing one minute 54 and the yellow jersey.
Well, we might have seen it coming, but it was no less impressive for that. Lance Armstrong launching a decisive attack on the first big day in the mountains for the fourth year running, and taking his 13th step. We talked about uh, trying to win the stage and possibly taking the jersey, uh, but I, you know, it was never a, a moment where we said, okay, let's go. I mean, the, the team just started pulling at the bottom of the obisk, and everybody was great today, and, and, and I, uh, Floyd had a little bit of a problem, but the team was super. The, way, the race is still open, you know, and, and this is the tour, so if you have a bad day, you lose, you know, anywhere from two to 20 minutes in, uh, in one stage. So you have to stay on top of it, and it's still open. And just to round off the first day in the mountains, Lance is also up to third in the King of the Mountains competition. Patrice Algon leads it, by the way, and if you're wondering how, it's because Algon built up most of his points over small climbs in the first week. After day one in the Pyrenees. Day two, though, was twice as tough. It was a free helicopter ride on offer to anyone brave enough to take it on. And the tour's first Pyrenean stage may have looked hard, but only until you turn the page of the official race guide and clock today's stage. Five vicious climbs spread over 195 kilometers and finishing with the worst of the lot up here to Plateau de Bay at an altitude of almost 1,800 meters. Before the gradient kicked in, though, there was some early sprint action. And Robbie McEwen took it ahead of Eric Zabel to cut the Germans' lead in the green jersey competition to just one point. For the second day running, Laurent Jalabert chanced his leg and was first over the second climb of the day. Behind him, the peloton paid rolling tribute at the memorial to Fabio Casartelli, the young Italian rider who died in a crash there in 1995. The mood of respect didn't last long, though, as Christophe Moreau and Carlos Sash got involved in a Franco-Spanish debate about the European single currency. As we join the race, Jalabert has been joined by Laurent Dufault of Jean de la Tour and Onsay's Isidro Nozal. There's 14 kilometres to go and the chase is on. These three leaders right now, Phil, have an advantage of 2 minutes and 27 seconds and here's the move coming from Onsay. Well, Armstrong has not panicked at all right now. In fact, I would think Roberto Jerez is riding in third or fourth position there, just behind Armstrong. He will wait until the last possible moment. This is Chucho Chechu Rubiera, as Lance likes to call him. Jose Luis Rubiera on the front. Jerez is there on the left-hand side. Yoshiba Belocchi is very close in, in the pink jersey. The blue and pink jersey is Raimundas Rumsas. Now, he is very high in the overall standings at fourth place. At the back, there is Laurent Brochard. On the left-hand side there is Dario Frigo. A lot of men are suffering. And as we go now to an attack by Laurent Jalabert at the front, he knows they are coming. The last time check was a minute 50, and he's had to go. Now, is he going to be wiped away in sight of the finish again? But he's going to give it his best shot. What a tough bike rider this is. He could see the other guys were weakening. He could feel that the time was slowly but surely coming back from the main field to himself, so he decides to go out alone. It'll be a hard call for him to survive, and it depends just exactly how much reserves he's got in those big thighs of his. It's 1.51 back to the yellow jersey group, which is being led by Lance Armstrong's teammate, Jose Luis Rubiera. This is the pain now at the back of the course here. And once again, we are seeing riders crack wide open. Looks like Lyseka here as well. The rider he's passing is Ivan Basso in the white jersey. So the three leaders are split now by half a minute. And the Armstrong group a little more than one minute behind. And there is the situation with Oscar Sevilla dangling at the back and suffering to try and hang on. This is the man who won the Tour of Spain, or finished second rather in the Tour of Spain last year, lost it on the final day, currently in 13th place overall, and just trying to hold on to a very select group of bike riders here. They are now just 14 seconds behind Laurent Jalabert. In the next half a kilometer, I expect they will see the Frenchman and rejoin him after he led this race for, again, almost 150 kilometers. 12 are just men, 12 and a half if we look back because Sevilla keeps coming in and going back again. Paulo Laurent Jalabert, for the second time in his many days, is going to look over his shoulder and see Lance Armstrong. He can't believe his luck. He's almost given us the same shrug of his head 
as he did last time. Another brilliant day for Jalabert. Absolutely superb to go out on the attack for two days, like he has done. He'll be rewarded this time at the finish with the lead in the King of the Mountains, but he really desperately wanted that stage win. In the distance, Oscar Sevilla on the front is Jose Luis Rubiera, the teammate of Armstrong. Armstrong uh, looking for his chance, I feel, here, as the pedal revs are lifted again, the gaps open once more. This mountain is relentless now, and it's nine kilometres still of it to go. Tyler Hamilton now just tapping Laurent Jalabert on the shoulders to say well done, good ride, we nearly pulled it off and Christophe Moreau who we will have to wait to see what the referee's decision is tonight as to whether or not he will receive punishment for punching Carlos Sastra in the face. Look at the pedalling action there of Rubiera on the front, just sitting tucked in nice and calmly behind him, I think they're actually picking up the pace just a little bit here, in fact you can see this is Rubiera's kick now towards the steeper, steeper part of the climb, he's lifting the place, I think they want to try and put time between themselves and one or two other riders, that popped Andrei Kivilev off the back immediately as well as Stefan Goubert. Well, Goubert suddenly couldn't lift it up one more notch, doing a great ride, there he is, but Andrei Kivilev will be upset, he's going to have to dig deep this ride from Kazakhstan, because the order's gone out from Lance to just lift the revs and see what happens, and he's reduced it by two riders, and here goes Haras, now is it pace making or an attack, and it might be... Oh, pace making. Sure what it is, I think it's pace making, yeah. Well, it's put this man into serious difficulty as well because they're literally blowing all of the Onse riders away. Serrano now has popped off the back of the group. Roberto Heras has come forward right now. Yoshiba Belocchi is surviving and Igor Gonzalez de Galdiano has now gone. Ah. We are going down to the same trio as yesterday. Roberto Heras, Lance Armstrong and Yoshiba Belocchi. But today they may well try and work one over on Yoshiba Belocchi because I think this is going to be a serious show of defiance by the man on the front Roberto Heras he wants to drag his team leader away and his team leader in the yellow jersey would like to give him a victory just under seven kilometers to go and we have the same three riders but Armstrong has lifted the revs it's up to Belocchi Belocchi must go round Heras or lose ground he's got to come round him now and I don't know whether he can Armstrong has made his move now he had planned to attack here when he when he reconnoitered the area in May he might have, we thought he might have changed his idea because he had the lead already yesterday when that, that to him was a little bit of a surprise. But Lockie has got to come, otherwise the Tour de France for him has ended right now. But Belocchi's trying to survive, he's trying to keep in contact with Armstrong, but look out for Heras. And in fact, Armstrong doesn't be doesn't look to me right now to be going full bore. He's waiting to see. He's tempting Belocchi to try and close the gap down to him. And look at this. I have a feeling any moment now we will see an acceleration come from Roberto Heras because Heras is very comfortable on the wheel of Belocchi. Armstrong right now is not opening up the big gap, and Heras is very happy just to stay there. Well, that's his job, to sit on Joshiba Belocchi for the last two years, third overall in Paris in the Tour de France, currently lying in second position. But now all Lance Armstrong is doing is repeating what he did in May by himself, and that's go out for a day's training. He's just sitting here, pedaling like he's taught himself. The only good thing is it's a little bit warmer than it was in May. It was in the minus Celsius temperatures then when he got to the top. Today it's around about 30 degrees Celsius. Well, this was the hero of the day, and look at that time gap already. Laurent Jalabert is over three minutes behind Lance Armstrong at the front of the bike race. Well, Lance Jalabert won't be at all interested in what is happening at the front of the race right now. Now, a little show of defiance by Belocchi, and I think that's all it was, because I don't think he can pick his pace up to go back up to alongside Lance Armstrong. Armstrong out of the saddle all of the time at the moment, keeping this perpetual cadence going that destroys the bike riders around the world. And once he knows he's beaten him, he'll settle back into his own rhythm. And in the next five kilometers, just how much time can he gain? Well, you know, he doesn't even really need to do this. He's leading the bike race at the start of the day by a minute and 12 seconds. What he's doing is riding away from the rest of the field, stamping his authority on the Tour de France today. Put all this into perspective, by the way, Phil. Laurent Jalabert has lost six minutes on the climb so far, and this is the group behind, and look how Portero is suffering. He's up alongside Serrano and Igor Gonzalez de Galdiano, the man who led this race for such a long time. These men now can only hope to survive. There is Raimundas Rumsas on the 
far side, and Armstrong is slowly but surely opening the gap between himself and Yoshiba Belocchi and his own teammate Roberto Heras. Rumzas looking back here to Serrano. Is anybody going to help me? Gonzalez de Galeano. These riders are together with Rumzas. Nobody going to help out here. Botero is there. Four great mountain bike, uh, great mountain climbers rather. And they can't get near this man who often tells us he's not a climber. It's a different type of racing as far as he's concerned. He just pedals quickly and rides them all off his wheel. Richard Baron looks as though he's just come out of the shower right now. Five times a winner of the King of the Mountains. Uh, take a bottle and receive that little professional foul. A little push off the, off the offering hand there from the director sporty. But nobody's going to complain about that. This is a vicious day in the Tour de France. As Armstrong now through the exhaust fumes of our helicopter and the shimmering heat of a hot day on the Plateau de Bataille. Abate rather is now going to put his name in the record books. The only other man who's won here is Marco Pantani. Well, I think that was a correct slip of the tongue you made there, Phil, because Plateau de Bataille means the plateau of the battle, that's and correct. that's exactly yeah, what's yeah. happening right now. This is a huge battle that Armstrong is delivering to himself and to his, the, the men who expect to outthrow him. And look at that, the gap is now becoming much more serious. It's slowly but surely opening. It's now hovering at 15 seconds. Roberto Heras is just sitting there for the moment, waiting to see if Bilocchi will fail. And if Bilocchi does fail, I wouldn't be surprised to see Roberto Heras launching the counter-attack it's still an awful long way to go to the summit for Lance Armstrong right now and he still has the frame of mind to sit up breathe easily as easily as he can and take the drinks on board well in effect uh, Harass is five full minutes of taking second place in the Tour de France at the moment he's not in a position to do much about it as we go under five kilometers yes still five kilometers to go but there is a real chance people are already talking of a US Postal 1-2 in this year's race as we switch back to the fatigue of Laurent Jalabert because in the mountains still to come this is a very tough tour now a relatively calmer day tomorrow then we climb at the giant of Provence Mont Ventoux and then we have two groups La Plagne and the Deux Alpes in the Alps before we go on to the final time trial and then the finish in Paris still an awful lot of racing to go uh, but there is nobody does not believe that Armstrong is not now going to win this tour by less than 10 minutes face there on Yoshiba Belocchi he's really suffering Armstrong is not opening up a huge gap at all in fact it's just crept up a couple more seconds to 17 seconds and Belocchi is basically riding his individual time trial right now he is trying to limit his losses on the Texan who's gone off on the hope of another lone victory just like the victory he got himself yesterday he would love to have offered that victory to the man who wears number three there Roberto Heras but what an incredible pedaling action of this man who after his testicular cancer Phil lost himself 20 pounds in body weight but he retained nearly all of the strength that he had Harass has gone Harass has attacked now this is what they were waiting for this is I think why Armstrong hasn't opened up the gap at all he was looking at the Spaniard who was in front of him look at this he waited to see Belocchi suffering and he went straight over the top of him this was the strongest man of the race yesterday and very quickly Armstrong will get that information from Johan Brunil I think it'll be 1-2 tonight he will wait once he knows he is cracked for Lockie. He will wait for Heras and he will give him the stage as a present from yesterday. That would be the form, I would think, of the team. And it's working out to perfection. Now, this little climber from Spain, magnificent yesterday, the outstanding man on the mountain, is now flying towards his captain. But what a professional. He looked over his shoulder to make sure that he had a very good gap between himself and Yoshiba Belocchi because he would not want at all to drag up Armstrong's competitor up to the wheel of the man who wears number one. In a few moments' time, Armstrong will certainly get that information from Johan Brunil. He will lift his pedaling action just a small amount, and I think he has done that right now, and he will very shortly be with Armstrong. And what a sight that will be. Well, the American flag is waving there for this brilliant athlete. Once uh, given a 20% chance of life because of a cancer, he's recovered and returned to win the Tour de France three times, and no one will give you odds against him winning it a fourth. Here we are in the first mountain stretch of this year's race, the Pyrenees, 
Little Roberto Heras, Lance selected him, handpicked him, brought him to the team to help him in the mountains. Now he's going to wait for him, and I think we'll give him the stage win because yesterday he says Heras was simply fantastic. And if he could have let him win yesterday, he would have done. But it was too dangerous because Yoshima Balocchi was right there as well. Now Armstrong keeps the revs up, but he knows the little man from Spain will pedal just as quickly as he can as we head towards the summit of the Plateau Dubai. And uh, I think, and I've lost count now, we're looking for a four kilometre banner. Yes, we are. Four kilometres to go for Lance Armstrong. The clock will start now on Roberto Heras. Well, they're coming out of the very steep part of the climb right now. There's the four kilometre banner that Armstrong went under a few moments ago. And here is Roberto Heras. What a beautiful pedaling action. This man is a brilliant little climber. And one day he too may win the Tour de France. He came alongside Lance Armstrong to learn, to try and improve his time trialing ability. But Belocchi is also making a pretty smart recovery here too. He is inside that gap as well. 12 seconds to Roberto Heras. They're on the false flat part of this course right now. This is the course, the part of the course where you can get the big gear in and start ticking it over. And you can see there Heras, uh, Belocchi changing up the gears. Well, this is the plateau bit of the climb now. And Armstrong knows he's coming. He looked over his shoulder. There are the gaps. 13 seconds and 25. As Lance Armstrong now just keeps his rhythm going. He would dearly love Heras to come alongside him say thanks for everything you've done for two days for me in the mountains and he's given him a brilliant lead overall now he'll be heading out to at least a minute and a half in the classification tonight unless Belocchi recovers on this false flag Heras looking over his shoulder to see he, if Belocchi catches him of course Heras will stop working he won't continue to take him up to the leader and he's always checking on that the face of the fighter, the only fighter seemingly in this year's Tour de France who believes he can have some form of combat with Armstrong. The gaps are very close indeed right now. Armstrong leads Roberto Heras by 14 seconds. In fact, Heras is slipping back and it's then just 12 seconds to Yoshiba Belocchi. If Heras doesn't close the gap on Armstrong right this moment, it's going to be Armstrong riding on his own towards victory. Armstrong really dare not slow down too much because he needs to build his advantage over Belocchi, whose advantage which was at the start of today, a minute and 12 seconds. There's a small time bonus on the line as well, which will push him out even further. But the other two will also get time bonuses, which won't completely uh, nullify the escape. But Armstrong himself now just doing all he need to do to increase his lead in today's stage of the Tour de France. There is just those 10 seconds between the two Spanish riders. Belocchi looks to me as though he's coming back because Heras has decided he can't reach his captain. I think he was told to sit up there because just at the moment when the US Postal Service team car went by, I think that was the moment he ceased to chase the front man, Lance Armstrong. He will now wait for Yoshiba Belocchi and I think allow Yoshiba Belocchi to set the tempo behind. What was happening there was that Heras was caught in between the two men and he was acting as a carrot and he was the man that in fact Yoshiba Belocchi was aiming at to catch and that was encouraging the, the man who was in third place on the road. Far down the slopes now, the ailing figure of Laurent Jalabert wants the leader. As we now see at three kilometres to go, Heras has turned off. Belocchi is coming back, so Heras, Heras will now sit behind him and wait, and maybe choose to sprint to second place. Armstrong has been given his head now as the leader of the team to build on his overall position and to increase his lead in the Tour de France tonight. There is Roberto Heras taking now the ticket collector's position. The man who will do no work and just see everybody is on board. Well, if this had been just a little bit steeper than it is right now, I think Roberto Heras would have made contact with Lance Armstrong. But Armstrong is on the part of the course which absolutely suits him. He can use his special power to get the bigger gear ticking over right now. And he has now started to build the big time gap over Yoshiba Belocchi. It is now 35 seconds to Heras and Belocchi right now. Heras has to play the team role. He was hoping, I think, to get himself a victory here. Coming back, and this is Santiago Botero. And in fact, it looks as if the man Igor Gonzalez de Galdiano is also pulling himself slowly but surely back to his own teammate. Well, trying to as the gaps close together because the uh, B of the Packers just simply flown away and left the workers on the mountainside. 
and here he is just riding to glory. This will be his 14th stage win in a Tour de France. A stage win which has gone past the memorial stone to his friend uh, Fabio Casatelli. Means a lot to Lance as he now continues his way to the top of the plateau. The kilometres are a little bit easier now as we start to level out on this beautiful mountain covered in thousands of people today to watch an American variety victory again. Well, look at this pedalling action as well, Phil. That's the pedalling action that's exactly the same as he had in the team time trial some time ago. And you look at that compared to the pedalling action of these two riders right now. It was that pedalling action that may well have lost Lance Armstrong the individual time trial around uh, Lorient. But right now it is being used to absolute perfection on the last two kilometres of the climb up here to the Plateau de Bay. Two kilometres, less than two miles, 1.8 to be precise for Lance Armstrong. And he's in amongst the motorbikes now. They'll chase those away as he continues progress towards the summit. As everybody just simply goes berserk here. This is what they wanted to see. They've waited probably eight hours and perhaps even 24 for those that came last night. The Basque flags are flying and they're waving at an American who is destroying the riders from Spain as he just rides towards the summit. A bigger lead in the Tour de France today, and no one will give you any odds now as to who will win this year's Tour de France. Well, under the banner there of, 40, of two kilometers to go, it's 32 seconds to these two chases right now. But the position of their pedaling action is completely different to that of Lance Armstrong. They are now just hoping to survive. Yoshiba Belocchi is trying to increase his advantage in the second place at the Tour de France this year. And Roberto Heras is going to leap up the overall standing this afternoon. Probably he will find himself well inside of the top ten. But Armstrong, Phil, is ticking away with that most unbelievable pedaling action which he has cultivated over the years since he came back from testicular cancer. The crowd here are encouraging every bike rider. They're even encouraging Lance, Lance Armstrong at the front, even though the majority of people here are Basque, they are recognising what is an unbelievable athletic performance. Well, they're shouting because they're saluting magnificent athletes here in the Pyrenees who have ridden to their maximum over some of the highest mountains this country has to offer. One man has proved he is head and shoulders above everybody else, but they'll shout even the last man home. It's a tremendous achievement by all of the riders. But what can you continue to say about this man? Superlatives simply don't describe just how he rides a bike. He comes here in the winter, he checks every inch of the road, he knows exactly where he's going to attack, exactly what he's going to do. He doesn't care who enters the Tour de France, he just sticks to the game plan. And the game plan he's got uh, worked out very many months in advance and that's why he comes to look at these courses and that's why he plans everything down to the final little minute of his attacks. Laurent Jalabert is almost three kilometres behind Lance Armstrong on this climb. That three kilometres is going to take him around about four, uh, four, uh, about nine minutes to cover. Armstrong right now can see the flam rouge in front of him. That little bridge over the road you can see there is the last kilometre of today's stage. And Armstrong still shows no signs of weakness at all. He's pedalling absolutely perfectly. This special in cadence he's managed to cultivate over the last few years is very reminiscent of the cadence in the mountains of Miguel Indurain and the great Spaniard, he won five Tour de France's in a row. Well, he's nosing away to almost a minute on the chase now, a minute added to the 112 he already has, plus his small time bonus on the line. If he would not fall off two and a half minutes, it might even be nearer three minutes uh, overall when we see the final situation tonight. Armstrong taking the shortest way to the summit of the plateau and building on every inch of the way. This will be his sixth win of the season and, uh, well, I won't say it'll be the sweetest, but it'll just be another routine day for this magnificent athlete. It reminds me what we said very much earlier on today, Phil, you and I, comme d'habitude, it said in the French newspapers this morning, business as usual, that's exactly what it has been for Lance Armstrong this afternoon, and that's also what it has been for his team, who've done a magnificent job setting up this victory. Yoshiba Belocchi is the man wearing number 21 there, he's just trying to keep himself as close to po as possible to Lance Armstrong this afternoon, and Armstrong's teammate there wearing number three, Roberto Heras, again doing an absolutely superb job to set up victory number 14 for Lance Armstrong here in stages at the Tour de France and no one currently racing in the professional circuit has won that many stages in the Tour de France 
14 for Lance Armstrong. He'll claim his third yellow jersey of the tour, having won the prologue and his third stage in this year's Tour de France. And on this sort of form, Paul, just how many stages can he win? The record, by the way, is held by Freddie Martins and in post-war years by Freddie Martin and Eddie Merckx, eight wins. Well, you know, if you look at the number of mountaintop finishes that are still left to go, Lance Armstrong could probably win most of those as well. I think he may well just try and ride a much more tactical race going into the next big mountains terrain, which is going to be the Mont Ventoux and then followed by the Alps. But this is going to go down as a great victory, one that was set up perfectly by his team. He's inside 200 metres to go right now. Lance Armstrong left no doubt in anybody's mind, the number one bike rider, the winner of the Tour de France for the past three years, and he will be the world rank number one by the end of this tour again, as he now races to increase his overall lead. Two profitable days here in the Pyrenees. Yesterday it was close, six hours aboard that saddle, and this time a little punch in the air yesterday. It's a clear two-arm salute today, because today he laid the foundation which will win him the Tour de France again this year. And did you see that, Phil? Six hours in the saddle, an average speed of only 33 kilometers an hour today. That's 19 miles an hour. That gives you an idea of just how difficult today's stage has been. Yoshiba Belocchi now is just trying to lose as little time as possible, but he's already lost himself 30 seconds on the clock on the finishing line. That added up to the bonus is 50, so it's going to be a big plummet down tonight. Well, I wonder if Heras will make it a 1-2 for US Postal. He's itching to go over the top of him. He'll wait till he sees the line at 45 seconds, the gap. But Locke won't have the legs now. He's tried to limit his losses as a little Roberto Heras grits his teeth, drives up to the line. US Postal first and second. Heras will climb up the overall classification tonight. He might even get a separate time as he comes round to the line. A minute and two behind, a minute three and probably a minute five for Josiba Bolocchi as uh, it's, uh, Patero comes in after that and Igor Gonzalez to Galeono after that. So the same three riders alone at the finish for the second day running although this time Bolocchi had to yield not just to Armstrong but to Heras as well. The man who started it all eventually finished 11 and a half minutes down consoled by the acclaim of the crowd and his fellow riders and no doubt also by the fact that he's now leading the King of the Mountains competition. 24 minutes back was Eric Zabel, like Robbie McEwen, well out of the points for the stage finish, and therefore still in the green jersey by a single point. Now, here's what the stage did to the standings. Armstrong confirms his status and extends his lead. Bilocki is the closest man to him, but getting further away, nearly two and a half minutes back now. Heras is up to seventh after two great days riding in the mountains. David Miller slips to 74th. Two days in the Pyrenees, two stage wins for the defending champion. The best Spanish climber was riding on his team. Beautiful scenery, but a pretty demoralizing picture for Lance Armstrong's rivals. Good afternoon. Stage 13 was a bit of a recovery day, really, to split up what might otherwise be a fatal one-two punch of the Pyrenees and Mont Ventoux. The scheduling was academic for Jackie Durand, mind you, because he was thrown off the race last night for using a team car to drag him up some of the climbs. The cameras didn't see it, but evidently the commissaires did. Mind you, the car can't have been going very fast because he still came in 41 minutes behind the leaders yesterday. Anyway, he's now on his way home, and lucky not to be joining him is Christophe Moreau, who the commissaires decided was the aggressor in yesterday's fight with Carlos Sash. Although, to be honest, there was about as much actual fighting in it as your average Audley Harrison bout. Anyway, Moreau was given a two-minute penalty, which, since he was 20 minutes down to start with, won't mean much to him. And Carlos Sast got 20 seconds, which seemed to confirm his view that he was the injured party. Now here's a look at the stage 13 route, 171 kilometers with three climbs near the start, but otherwise flat until Bézier, where there was a little kick up towards the finish line. This is the chasing group now with Laurent Jalabert, they're one minute behind right now, they will just uh, ride to the finish and hope to survive. 
Now this is the traffic circle I was talking about a few moments earlier, but from now onwards, Phil, it's nearly all uphill to the finish. It's not much, but after 100 miles in the saddle, it's a long climb. And it's who is going to judge the sprint to the best. They've tried to rid each other, but it hasn't worked out. Now it is going to be a one dash to the line, and you've got to judge your sprint to perfection. It is a long way up this road. Echeverria is making it plainly obvious he is feeling like the wind today. He's looking at everybody. The ride on one side of the road here, forcing the attack only on the right shoulder of the riders. Lataza, by the way, at the front, only ever won one race in his life a couple of years ago, and he's starting the sprint. Well, that'll cost him the race because you can't lead out for the line and win. But look now at the face of Echeverria in second place. Bogart is there. Rochard is dropping off the back a little bit. Miller is in fourth place. Miller's going to have to say something special here as they come over the top towards the line. Now, Lataza is leading out Echeverria to perfection. One Spaniard leading out the other, but they're not friends, and he realises now, and well, Echebria won't go through. Miller waits widely, take the wheel of Brochard. Yes, he does, because Lola Brochard's seen his chance now. Miller is shoulder to shoulder as they come to the line now. Brochard is going. David Miller might finish this one off. He's won a stage in the Tour of Spain before like this. Now, can he win this one? David Miller is going to take the stage and absolutely brilliantly done. David Miller is not the fastest sprinter in the world, but you would have thought so today for the win for Britain in the Tour de France today the only British rider in the race David Miller takes the honours as David Echeverria now knows to his cost Miller brilliantly outmaneuvered the Spaniard to take the stage win with Michael Bogard Laurent Brochard and David Lataza making up the numbers ten minutes behind them Eric Zabel and Robbie McEwen were winding up for a sprint to decide the lead in the points competition but now Baden Cook is going to try and take the lead but Danilo Hondo here is coming up wondering where his teammates are he doesn't know what to do but the sprint is starting now and it is where the green and the white jerseys go and McEwen is coming on the left here chopped a little bit out of it he's going to finish ahead of Zabel it is touch and go but I do believe that they will now be equal on points well they were but that activated the tie-break procedure which starts with stage wins of which they've each got one apiece. McEwen though has been marginally better placed at the finish over the rest of the stages so he now leads the green jersey competition by no points. As to who'll be wearing it by the end of tomorrow though no predictions. None from the race director either Jean-Marie Leblanc was busy congratulating David Miller who now has a road stage win to go with his prologue victory two years ago. The first British rider to register one since Max Chandry in 1995. I was on a mission today. I told the team that I wanted to win today and I knew I had to go on the first climb after like eight kilometers. So I put myself in the front line of the start for once. And I thought, right, this is it, I'm going. And uh, yeah, I was relaxed, but I was confident. <laughs> All right then, let's update the overall for you. Although there's not much to update really because all the big names finished in the bunch. Laurent Jalabert sneaks into the top 10 courtesy of being in the break. David Miller took back 10 minutes of the 40. He lost saving his legs yesterday. There was just one climb on stage 14. Unfortunately for the riders, it was this one, Mont Von 2. Not what you're looking for after you've already ridden 200 kilometers through the shadeless scorch of Provence. And to make things worse, they'd be able to see it long before they got to it, because Mont Ventoux dominates the landscape in Provence on the same scale that it haunts the riders' imaginations. Not a mountain that you'd want to tackle in anything less than your best physical condition, as David Miller, yesterday's stage winner, was perhaps about to find out. After his brilliantly timed sprint to the line in Bézier yesterday, David undertook a rigorous program of rehydration, starting with a beer to help him produce the post-race urine sample and working his way through a quantity of Chateau photo opportunity champagne and on to wine with dinner. Not quite out of the Lance Armstrong handbook of stage celebrations that, and it didn't look as though we'd be seeing David up the front today. In fact, unless the team sent someone to his hotel room this morning to wake him up, it looked like we might not see him at all. Anyway, quite apart from yesterday's festivities, this was a stage he was dreading, and he wasn't the only one. From Tommy Simpson's death on this climb 35 years ago to Eddie Merckx finishing the stage in an oxygen tent, Mont Ventoux is baked in history, and none of it is reassuring. For Lance Armstrong, though, the history is more recent and more personal. In 2000, the stage to Mont Ventoux was a microcosm of the whole tour. Italy's Marco Pantani continually attacking, Lance Armstrong matching his tempo, then upping it. As they approached the line together, Armstrong passed up the chance of an historic win at one of cycling's holy places and offered it to Pantani as a mark of respect to a great climber. 
Far from accepting gracefully, though, Antani continued his attacks, this time in the media. And as relations between the two riders descended into war by press conference, Armstrong realised he'd given away an opportunity that may never come again. Today, of course, it has. If I get there and in good position and, and, and I have an opportunity to win again, will I, will I take it? Absolutely. Well, I mean, what, do, would I ever do what I did again? No, never. Understandably, this of all stages is the one Armstrong wants to win. At the same time, though, this of all stages is impossible to guarantee. It's not a, a, a climb or a mountain that you can be uh, too, too cocky with. I mean, you have to be, respect that, that mountain because it's so difficult. In my opinion, it's the hardest climb in the Tour, maybe even the hardest climb in France. Uh, so for me to say I want revenge against the mountain or I want revenge against what happened in 2000 would be a mistake because it's, it's hard and you need to just basically survive it. Well, that's what every stage to Mont Ventoux looks like because the final climb is too tough to include any others along the way. So there's 200 kilometres of dread before everyone's worst fears are realised. An 11-man break formed remarkably early in the stage and when it hit the slopes of the Ventoux, two men went off the front of it. Russia's Alexander Botsharov and five-time King of the Mountains winner Richard Viron, who up until this point could have been riding in disguise for all the impact he'd had on the race. Five minutes and three seconds. That's Armstrong to Veronk and Veronk has gone. Well, Veronk has launched the attack. He came up a couple of times alongside Botsharov to see just whether or not he had it in his legs right now. And Veronk looking for the challenge that brought him the title of best climber in the Tour de France on five occasions and right now he's opened up just a small advantage this is a, a scurry really to test and see whether Botcherov has got anything at all left, left in his legs these two riders are five minutes ahead of the yellow jersey group of Lance Armstrong and when we looked back at the Armstrong group a few moments ago Phil I wasn't sure whether or not Levi Leipheimer was there his teammates have done everything possible to keep him in contact but I think he too was having a hard time with the accelerations being set on the front by Jose Luis Rubiera. Well, Richard Veron, this was his plan for the day, to get an early move, get some time, and then race for the finish like a rabbit. And he's got him onto the self onto the climb with a lead of just over seven and a half minutes. Now, with that gap at five minutes and ten seconds, he's about ten and a half kilometres from the summit. He's left himself a chance. He has a chance, he's a climber. And once you've been a climber, you always have that ability in your legs to stay clear off the front of the main field. He now will try and find as much courage as possible. He's looking over his shoulder to see if he has opened the gap between himself and Alexander Bocharov. And as we pull back there, you can see that he has slowly but surely started to increase the distance between him and the Russian. There is the Russian right now, and uh, the Russian takes on board a drink. Uh, a little professional acceleration there for the Russian but that's not going to help him too much in the picture, the long picture of this whole climb up to the summit of Mont Ventoux. He's already one minute behind Richard Veronk. It is amazing how fast you lose time when the elastic snaps, Paul. One when you minute go, back to that man. When you go, you go on the slopes of a mountain like this. Uh, Veronk now is looking for all of his courage to try and get himself to the summit of the climb. But there is the group of the yellow jersey of Lance Armstrong. And looking down on the group, we can see Armstrong, Belocchi is in there, Acevedo is there, Rumsas is on the left-hand side, the white jersey there is Ivan Basso, Santiago Botero is there as well, Francisco Mancebo is also there for Ibanesto.com. So all of the American challenges for Lance Armstrong have disappeared today, again on the slopes of the mountains, and again, another acceleration coming from Acevedo, trying to put pressure on Armstrong, but look at the ease that Armstrong came across as they go past Thor Hushvod. Well, this is the second time he stretched uh, the team. He lost Igor Gonzalez to Galliano in the first attack. At least Bellocchi is hung on. I think Bellocchi is actually riding very, very well indeed here. He's just going to follow Lance Armstrong, but he's got to go for him sooner or later if he wants to. And uh, no longer on the back after that acceleration is the Colombian. So Botero has gone. There he is. No, that, yes, he is. going backwards, but also behind them is Mancebo, yeah. and I think even further back is Santiago Botero. So that acceleration really has caused a serious gap in this group now. The gap again reducing in numbers all of the time. Armstrong looks very comfortable. 
Rumsas is riding a superb Tour de France. He starts the day in fourth position, and I think by the end of this afternoon he will find himself in a podium position in third spot because Igor Gonzalez de Galdiano was left behind quite a few kilometres ago. This man still hanging on, Richard Baron, 4 minutes 12 seconds, the last time check we have at 9 kilometres from the finish. It is still just on 30 seconds a kilometre, he has to concede. Well, his position and his pedalling action is very good right now, it still looks fluid, he's still getting out of the saddle when the steep part of the gradient kicks into his thighs, keeping the tempo as high as possible. He has to be very concentrated right now because he's a great chance of surviving the only man, and I actually didn't give him that much of a chance a few kilometres ago because I had a feeling after 180 kilometres at the front of the bike race he would have dead legs when he came to this climb. But right now he is riding alone in front of a group which is becoming the very elite elite group of the Tour de France, the group with Lance Armstrong, Basso, Rumsas and Yoshiba Bellocchi. Team management coming up alongside, they will give him as much encouragement as possible, but this man will get an awful lot of encouragement from the people at the side of the road, because he has produced some incredible exploits on the roads of the Tour over the last many years. Veronka has been quite an animator of any of the mountain stages, whether they were stages in the Pyrenees or in the Alps, and right now he would very much to lo love to win here because this is probably the closest mountain he could really get to home ground. He's a, a Provençal himself, he comes from in between Marseille and Toulon, and right now his pedalling field looks pretty good and he might well just cause the big surprise of the day, because I don't think anybody thought Viron would win here. There's a nice view of the top of Mont Ventoux. You can see it for over 150 kilometres on a clear day around France. And right at the highest point is where we are sat and where the riders are coming towards us. Well, Richard Viron right now not very far away from Chalet Renard. And from this point onwards he goes out and there's a move here. This is Bilocchi well, at last and Armstrong has to respond to this one. Well, you've got to take your hat off to the Spaniard. He said he felt he was good enough to attack Armstrong in the mountains. Now we've got the Spanish-American tandem, and, uh, and Armstrong says, you do it to me, and I'll do it to you. And he's reacted immediately now, and you never ruffle the feathers of the American, because I don't think Bolocchi has the legs now. Well, don't play with me, that's what he said. The move came from Yoshiba Bolocchi. It was a good move, a violent attack, and immediately Armstrong responded. He's coming up. This is the man who was in the breakaway a few moments to go Pradera he can only look and see what's happening he will see his team leader behind him he will try and recover to pace him for a few moments but that's not going to happen right now Armstrong would have been content to sit there and ride to the summit in the company of those other guys but once the attack came he had to launch the counter-attack well I salute Bolocchi for the way he attacked but Armstrong was waiting for it all to happen and he just went straight right Armstrong now is free to fly and can he fly quick enough to bring back Richard Baron as they progress towards the summit? I think there are still a couple of riders in front, Alexander Botcherov and Marco Serpolini. I haven't noticed them come back, but now Armstrong is racing and it's all on a win here. And with every pedal rev, he is going to get seconds more over Yoshiba Balocchi. The banners are coming at Richard Veronque, uh, quick and fast now, another kilometre ticked off, four to go. The time gap at the last kilometre banner was three minutes, 50 seconds. It is going to be touch and go now. We're looking at the gloves here of Lance Armstrong. I don't know whether he's just trying to hold his bike on the ground there because he's going so quickly up this mountain. There are three riders, as far as we can work out, still in front of him. This is unbelievable to watch this pedalling action of the man who is walking away with the Tour de France at the moment. It's a completely different style to that of Richard Viron. Viron's style right now reminds me of a former teammate of mine, Robert Albon. He finished third overall in the Tour de France, but he was a climber like this, Longeline, like Richard Viron, always out of the saddle, battling with his machine, looking for any amount of strength just to keep the gears ticking by. Compare that with Armstrong, who sits firmly on his machine and ticks over the pedals at a hundred revolutions for every one minute. Well, Baronowski is still in the frame somewhere down the line. They're talking of him being at 3 minutes 15. I'm just wondering if they've confused him with Botcherov, but we'll find out, I'm sure, as Lance Armstrong continues his ascension of the mountain here. 
to the applause of the crowd this champion for three years of the Tour de France and soon to be crowned for a fourth year because there's no doubt he is a man riding in his own atmosphere as he races up the climb he continues now Richard Verong is hanging on Armstrong is still three minutes 50 behind at the five kilometer banner these men are separated by around about one kilometre on the road. Armstrong is looking superb. He may well have left it just a little bit too late to close down on Richard Biron. But look what waits ahead. Those are the final four kilometres of the Mont Ventoux this afternoon. And Viren coming again to one of the steeper gradients here. Getting down into the saddle. Just trying to keep the body going. Just trying to find the strength to keep his pedals going round. Because this man has been away for 195 kilometres on on today's stage and he's hoping to survive for just four more three minutes and 43 seconds to Lance Armstrong and it's in these portions here that Armstrong will eat away 20 30 40 seconds for every one kilometer of climbing left well the crowd extraordinarily quiet as they spot the Mayo Jean on the ascension here as he concentrates on keeping that cadence up to the required revs per minute Armstrong just looking at a point in front on the road and just concentrating on his speed. He knows that no one now behind him is staying with him. We drop back a little bit. Here is Ramzas, Basso, Acevedo and uh, the other rider there uh, with him is Belocchi. As just latching on the back too, we have Mansebo now. But he's done well to hang on as they continue through this crowd. They are dropping away from the action. Armstrong is riding away with the Tour de France here. There are a huge amount of American spectators here, but I think the incredible thing, Phil, about cycling supporters is they're cheering every man on the slopes of this climb here. It doesn't matter whether Richard Bironc is a Frenchman, the Germans, the French and the Belgians and the Dutch, they're all chasing and, sh and supporting these men for the phenomenal physical effort that they're putting in. Perhaps with that shot towards the summit you can get some idea, and it is only some idea, as just how steep Mont Ventoux is. And Armstrong, is, even though his chain is at the bottom of the gear frame here, it just seems to conquer it with great ease. The French flag, and the Spanish flag, and they're watching an American here desperately try to scramble up to the leader. He's not going to do it, I don't think, today. This man is suffering now like he's never suffered in a Tour de France before and he knows the win will mean so much to him and indeed so much to France. Well, those 11 riders had the chance of winning the stage at the bottom of the climb. They all got blown away by Veronque, all picked up by the men behind. It looks as though Pradera is now being dropped as he so now cracks and Belocchi is also shaky. Well, this is amazing. Belocchi tried desperately. He's paying the price here now. Rumzas could well be looking for a higher place in Paris than we thought because he's still up there. And look at that ride by Pradera. He'd been dropped and he saw his team leader in difficulty and he dug even deeper. He pulled himself forward and he's going to try and pace him back to Rumsas. Rumsas is looking at climbing up to second place in the overall standings this afternoon. He's a long way down on Yoshiba Belocchi, but with performances like that over the next couple of days, it's going to be very dramatic in the Alpine passes. Armstrong is still riding. I don't think he's got enough time out on the road to pull back Richard Viron, because Richard Viron has still got to pull himself up there. Viron, right now, the top half of his body is singing out in pain to him, saying, please stop. But he won't, because he can see as Armstrong goes under the two kilometer banner, Richard Viron is under the 1,000 meter sign. Well, he may have judged it absolutely to perfection here because the old legs have gone now. They are on automatic pilot at one kilometre to go, but he's probably got the gap that will win in the stage, and you've got to admire the man for that. It was a breakaway of more than 200 kilometres for Veron to get the victory on Von Two. He is surviving. Armstrong is coming, but not quick enough now. But the good news for Armstrong is everybody near him in the overall classification is hating Mont Ventoux and losing time. Veron is coming to the summit of Mont Ventoux in the twilight of his cycling career. Well, he's been a great climber throughout his career. You don't win the King of the Mountains on six separate occasions without being great. And uh, that uh, little victory salute there, slightly reminiscent of the one in Courteray and Courchevel many years ago. But this one, I think, will probably be the sweetest because he probably didn't even expect it. A little gold chain around his neck carries a small bicycle. The big bicycle brought him to the summit today. 
It's really, really steep, that final corner. It's where Lance said to Pantani, you can win the stage two years ago. Well, this time, this man has earned it in his own right. 200 kilometers in the lead, and victory for Richard Baron in the grand style of the Tour de France. Well, that was courage, Phil. The last five kilometers that this man rode were on sheer guts and courage, because he can't have had very much left in his body at all there. The leader of his team at the start, a difficult ride through the Pyrenees, two tough Pyrenean stages, but he got himself the win. Armstrong, though, is doing a great job himself. It's a solitude here, the so lone ride of Armstrong up the slopes of the Mont Ventoux at the moment, and what he is doing is increasing time over everybody else in the overall classification. Well, in second place, a Russian rider today, Alexander Botcharov of AG2R, another French team. He grits his teeth on what is one of the steepest sectors of the course. He, he's allowed to freewheel those last couple of metres and about 1 minute 57. But now, as we look backwards, Armstrong was coming. The mountain just not quite long enough. But this champion of the Tour de France has ripped the legs off all of his main adversaries again. And still he pedals this remarkable low gear. He's going to save uh, or gain uh, more minutes now on the rest as he comes in at 2 minutes and 19 seconds. Now, this is Rumzas, another outstanding performance by this Lithuanian. And he needs the seconds, and he knows it. He will fight to the line. Seconds could make the difference in Paris. He's got to fight and squeeze them out now, because advantage in the time trial might be his. He comes in at 3.36. Basso at 3.38 for sixth place. This will be Mancebo now coming up to the line too. The other young Spanish rider who's had a great Tour de France so far. It has hurt everybody. Now Balocchi racing for eighth place as Yoshiba knows now every second is putting him further behind Armstrong in the race. He comes up to the line, he will finish eighth. Well, you know, if Balocchi had attacked earlier, Armstrong would have countered earlier and this man might have come over the brow at the finish in the process of being overtaken by a clockwork Texan. He didn't though, and there's confirmation of what a cheap comic might call the Von 2-3. Vironk taking the stage by 1.58 from the only other survivor of the breakaway, Alexander Botcharov, with Armstrong 2.20 back in third, and Belocki another 1.45 behind him. Seven and a half minutes behind the winner and slipping down the placings was the former yellow jersey, Igor Gonzalez de Galdiano. Or Santiago Botero, who started the day fifth, had an even worse Von 2 experience, coming in over 15 minutes back. Behind them, David Miller came in 67, 18 minutes down, while of the sprinters, Eric Zabel survived the day better than Robbie McEwen, although there were no points for either of them. Afterwards, David Miller spoke to Matt Rendell. David Miller, that looked hellish. Yeah, it was. It was a horrible day. A really hard day. Was uh, your performance affected by uh, yesterday's victory and celebrations? Uh, not celebrations, just uh, yesterday being off the front for 170 k's. Just a really hard climb, just tired. At the finish, the French popular hero who tried and failed to escape from a mountain stage win two days running congratulated the one who finally managed it. Some of his past victories may have been tainted by a suspension for drug use, but today Richard Veronque seems to have shown that he can still win and win clean. J'ai cru euh, au bout de 4 km d'ascension parce que j'avais les jambes qui tournaient pas mal et, et j'étais j'étais surmonté survolté j'ai vu tout ce public qui était là et j'ai dit maintenant c'est à toi à jouer et oublie que tu as mal et, et j'ai tout donné. It's hard to close a gap like that, especially on a climber, so... But the Von 2 is a special beast, you never know what happens to somebody up, up top, and uh, I didn't lose hope. I was going as hard as I could to, to try and win the stage, but hey, what a great ride. Different scenery, same suffering in prospect. Today, the tour arrived in the Alps, and here's a reminder of how things stood coming into it. Lance Armstrong in control of the race, with a lead of over four minutes on his closest challenger, Oseba Belocchi. 
Lance Armstrong's challengers face the same problem they had in the Pyrenees, how to cope with the murderous pace he's been setting in the mountains with that distinctive high cadence riding style. Of course, if you look up cadence in the dictionary, there's no mention of pedalling frequency or in fact cycling at all. But the main definition tells you all you need to know anyway, the beat or measure of something rhythmic. And on the evidence of the last couple of years, it looks as though Lance has got non-stop techno coming through his earpiece, while the rest of the peloton is tuned to Radio 2. It is going to be a question of setting the tempo, which is his. That cadence is unbelievable. He ticks over those pedals. Armstrong climbs on a small gear and turns the pedals up to 100 times a minute. That's maybe 20 times per minute more than serious climbers like Bellocchi and Botero. And incidentally, more than Lance Armstrong Mark 1. When he first raced the Tour, he rode like most non-flyweights do, on power. It wasn't until his post-cancer reinvention of himself as a cyclist that he adopted the Baby Steps approach in conjunction with his coach, Chris Carmichael. What Lance will do is uh, keep his pedal cadence higher than most of his, uh, his opponents out there. Um, he'll uh, probably average about 90 to maybe 100 RPMs at times. Uh, that kind of helps reduce muscle stress, uh, saves his legs and can keep himself essentially fresher for the climb. Same speed, less effort is the magic formula sought by every cyclist. Not surprisingly, it's started to catch on. Sure, he does pedal at high frequency, but that's mainly when we see him on the TV in those attacking, winning moves. The rest of the time, he's not quite so high. It's only when he's really on the attack, and that's the difference, I think. To attack, you've got to be able to rev out on the mountains, which is very, very difficult to do. The rest of the time, you've got to be trying to, to sit in and just, just maintain that momentum, um, which is what he's doing generally behind his, his US train. Uh, he's very, very comfortable. And definitely what he's doing now is, is what I, I'd imagine a lot of the guys are trying to, uh, to follow and trying to copy. The cycling at the moment is fashion is high cadence um, because Lance is winning. If Lance wasn't winning and it was Ulrich winning with big gear, everyone would be training big gear. Whoever wins Tour de France creates the fashion. Coming from the track and the time trial background, I was very much a drop heel sort of driving cyclist. But in the mountains, we've seen Lance on his, you know, he's on his toes, he's pedalling away, and it's it works. It's definitely the way to go. Uh, it just takes a lot of time, a lot of work to become efficient yourself, especially if you you haven't been that way the rest of your career. So this time next year, the entire peloton could be metronoming up mountains like wind-up toys. Although following fashion doesn't necessarily mean being able to catch it. Armstrong's ascent of Mont Ventoux 2 on Sunday was timed at 58 minutes, fastest the famous mountains ever been climbed in the Tour. Just the kind of news to put the rest of the peloton in the mood for a big alpine day. And there it is, the longest of the entire race at 226.5 kilometres. Six minor climbs along the way before the big one up to Le Dezau. Christophe Moreau wouldn't be climbing it though. The Credit Agricole leader who'd spent most of the tour either on the floor or trying to put other riders there crashed again, gashed his lip and abandoned what's been a miserable race for him with the misery clearly evident as he went. The day's Reckless Driver Award, meanwhile, went to Benoit Joachim of US Postal, clearly failing to stay in lane on one of the climbs and cutting up Bonjour's Sylvain Chavanel. At the front, Santiago Botero was the highest placed rider in a seven-man break which at one stage had built up a lead of over ten minutes. As we join it, they're on the final climb with a lead of about nine minutes and less than 11 kilometres to go. The pace of the chasing bunch, meanwhile, is shelling riders off the back. As he's inside at three and a half kilometres to go to the finish now for Santiago Botero. Former white jersey winner, former King of the Mountains. He won the King of the Mountains back in 2000. He's won two stages before, one in 2000 at Briançon, and of course here at Lorient in the time trial, which he can claim now to be the first Colombian to do that. Now Mario Ertz has come up behind Axel Merckx here at the back of the race. So they're riding for second and third, while the leader is at three kilometres from the summit. And I can't see anybody getting to him now. The Anse Armstrong peloton at seven minutes and seven seconds. They're closing, but not quick enough, I don't think. The breakaway will succeed today. Merckx really has been the king of the mountains on this day, winning most of them, and probably having done enough to claim fifth or sixth place overall. Probably. In the king of the mountains, not the race, by the way. This is another move. It could be Mancebo. 
quick response coming from Onse there, nailing everything back right now, trying to keep control of the front end of the main field. Armstrong quite happy today. The only teammate I think he's got left in this group with him, in fact, is Roberto Heras, who's been kept in reserve. The man on the front right now there is Michael Bogert. He'll be doing the work for Levi Leipheimer. Leipheimer is in that group. I've seen him once or twice fairly close to the front, so he's conserving his ninth place in the overall classification. Meanwhile, back in the struggling department now, it looks like Ivan Gotti, twice a winner of the Giro d'Italia. And also there is Oscar Sevilla hanging on to the tail of this group. Well, and not quite the rider he was last year, Paul, is he? Hasn't had a great Tour de France so far. In fact, he's in a group of riders, I think, just making contact with the Armstrong group. There, I thought, was a quick glimpse of Roberto Harris. There's number one, Armstrong. On the far side there, uh, Massimiliano Lelli, but this is the man who will get the victory this afternoon. And again, what a tough way to win a mountain stage, going out on the attack, 100 miles from the finish. A quick glimpse there, Leipheimer moving up to the front of his group there with Michael Bogert. And uh, the race completely opened up here by Santiago Botero. He will get the win this afternoon, and that will make him only the second person in this bike race to have multiple wins to his credit because Armstrong is the only other person to have won more than one stage so far Armstrong has a total of three and with this win today this man will get himself his second Lance Armstrong about to end his fifth day as race leader of the Tour de France his rivals clearly have not had the strength to lift the tempo and try to leave him they've used their team to set the pace but they haven't cracked Lance Armstrong this rider wanted the stage win 18 minutes slower than Armstrong to this point of the Tour de France. No longer a marked man. He's pulling back possibly four or five minutes of those lost 18. And he might well uh, do well in the time trial still to come. And, of course, the two remaining mountain stages. But today he went out to make amends for the disaster of Mont Ventoux. And he's certainly done that as Santiago Botero, Botero comes up towards the line as a Colombian for his second stage win of the year in the Tour de France that is he won the time trial at Lorient now he's going to win at the road race stage here to Les Deux Alpes the only other man to win here Marco Pantani he's delighted absolutely delighted now this was a long way to go for the win but he read it right as the breakaway did the other day on Mont Ventoux this time he's done it Thank you, he says, and there's a lot of Colombian flags waving. Like all good professionals, make sure there's nobody creeping up, and there isn't. Well, that was a great win, absolutely superb, and a long way out. This man is really a gutsy bike rider. Losing 15 minutes can blow your morale completely, and that's what he lost on the slopes of the Mont Ventoux. But today he came back and looked for the breakaway. He knows there'll be breakaways every day right now because Armstrong's not going to chase men who are 20 minutes behind him in the overall classification, and he got himself the win. Botero delighted, his bike probably just relieved. And behind him, the chief survivors of the original break, led home by Mario Ertz, who won the Belgian subcategory ahead of Axel Merckx. Behind them, though, the yellow jersey group, with nothing major at stake, was refusing to come quietly. And here comes an attack from Balocchi. Now there's the reaction from Armstrong. It was a little bit slow. He said, uh, that's number 21, that's the man second to me, so he's gone after him. And Armstrong now, look at that, that's a cheeky move, Paul. Well, it's a very good move by Balock. In fact, he's opened oh, up the gap. He's gone straight past Heras. Acceleration. Heras is there, he'll look over his shoulder and see Armstrong, but Armstrong won't panic. We are now looking at just seconds is what Balock can gain if Armstrong doesn't come to his wheel. But I think the Texan has got this one under complete control. Slowly but surely, he's pulling himself back up to the slipstream. And Rumsas, look how attentive he is, Phil. He's come across there as well. These are the top three riders in the overall stand of the Tour de France this year it was a brave move but it's done nothing at all to change the standings a huge move on a huge gear by Yoshiba Balocchi and Armstrong a little bit slow to react and a bit shocked maybe but he's got out of that hole very very easily indeed concentrating look at his face as he comes up here and just gets onto the back wheel of Balocchi and goes Rumsas now because Rumsas is looking for second place and there's a little reminder too that he might well be looking for second place overall in these next two days in the mountains. Rumsas keeping the viewing figures high in Lithuania and he led home the yellow jersey group ahead of Balocchi and the jersey himself. All of them of course on the same time. The big story of the day though was Santiago Botero's second stage win of this tour and afterwards he spoke to Matt Randall. Ha sido un triunfo 
para mí en este Tour, mucho mejor que quedar cuarto, quinto en la general, ganar dos etapas eh, de diferentes tipos, como una como la montaña y la otra como la contrarreloj, para mí es un triunfo. Y bueno, eh, tuve un día malo, eh, soy humano, no soy una máquina, como todos los que estamos aquí, y, y bueno, eh, afortunadamente conté con libertad hoy para coger la fuga, por el tiempo que había perdido el, el Mont Ventus, y, y bueno, de la escapada... Eh, Pude mantener un, un fuerte ritmo en, en la ascensión y, y llegar primero a la meta. You know, the only man who've won mountain stages and long time trials the past five years have also won the Tour. Otero has shown he can do both, although of course those lost 15 minutes on Mont Ventoux put him well out of contention for the overall. And while the Kelme team mechanics set about straightening Botero's bike frame, the rest of the race was arriving on the instalment program. Eric Zabel came home in a group just under 20 minutes behind the winner, with David Miller just over. Another couple of minutes back was Robbie McEwen. So, no substantial change on the leaderboard, except that Santiago Botero moves up to seventh after clawing back almost half the 15 minutes he lost on stage 14. At the top, Armstrong is treating Belocchi more like an annoyance than anything else, watching him all day and running after him like an irritated parent only when necessary. That was a strong attack at the end, actually. I didn't, uh, I didn't expect that, and I didn't know he was attacking until they told me on the radio. But it's important that you that you cover all of those attacks because if they feel like you know one day say you let him go and he gets 10 seconds, then all of a sudden he has this this huge morale boost, and the next day he attacks all day long. So it's important you jump on it immediately and. Not necessarily show them his boss, but certainly let them know that you're not going to let him go. Well, he's got three kids of his own land, so he knows the importance of instilling discipline, and he remains what that great cycling fan Ray Winston might call the dad. Day two in the Alps was far and away the most difficult mountain stage of the Tour. Not the degree of difficulty seemed to be making much difference to US Postal. Lance Armstrong's team were turning the race into an American remake of the Three Musketeers. All for one, and all for one. Now for all their tireless effort, they don't get a lot of face time, Lance's supporting cast. So we went to US Postal director sportif Johan Brunel and asked him to give them a bit of individual credit. Floyd is he's doing well. He had a, a, an off day, the first mountain stage. He doesn't have, doesn't have the experience of big stage races. He's a, a key rider in the mountains. Benoit is a workhorse. First of all, he's from Luxembourg. We started in Luxembourg, so he was very motivated to start the tour. In the flat stages, he's uh, the guy who has to work, do the, do the dirty job, let's say. Ekimov is, uh, every book, everybody says Eki in the team. He's back after, after he retired last year. The true professional, an example for the young guys and a uh, solid worker where you can count on, on the flat, in the flat stages, uh, in the team time trial, in the middle mountain stages, always there. George is the motor of the team, always there, able to go fast on the flat, able to pull in the mountains, really somebody uh, consistent. I would put him in the same class like, uh, like Eki. Somebody who can uh, do his job in the flat stages and in the mountains. Made big progression compared to last year, worth his uh, weight in gold. Pavel is uh, the tallest guy in the team, probably also the strongest guy in the team, and also the quietest guy in the team. Never speaks, never complains, always rides solid as a rock. Jose Luis Rubiera, we call him Chechu. Everybody says Chechu, that is how everybody knows Chechu. Probably the best person in the world, very good guy, always happy, always friendly. In the mountains, he does the, the pace for the team. When he puts the pace, it's very fast. A lot too fast for most of the bunch. And he's the guy who makes the first selection. Roberto is, uh, I think, together with uh, Lance and Belocchi, the best climber of the Tour de France. He's somebody that Lance can rely on in the mountains. If, uh, if you have somebody like that, it's really uh, a safe feeling. So Lance, Lance is the, the team leader, obviously, and uh, his only role is to win the Tour. There's the stage, three of the highest category climbs in cycling, the Galibier, the Madeleine, and the final climb up to La Plagne. Well, the day was too much for two big names, Oscar Sevilla lying 11th at the start, abandoned with stomach cramps, and Laurent Dufault, who was 45th, climbed off too. Just 29 kilometers into the stage, Rabobank's Michael Bogard attacked in a small group, 
which eventually shrank to just himself. As we join the race, he's made it to the final climb. With five and a half kilometers to go, he's being pursued by CSE's Carlos Sast. Behind him, a group containing Lance Armstrong is chasing two, and the pace is dropping men like Igor Gonzalez de Galdiano off the back. Oh, the whole body is putting power into those legs right now just to try and get up the mountain. Every time he picks his head up, he'll only see the road kick again. At least he's got the crowd shouting him on. They, of all the people, appreciated just how hard this mountain is. Many of them have ridden up here on the bike as well. So they know the strength of this man, and the pursuit continues. And it is closing now rather rapidly. Two minutes, 51 seconds is the gap now. Sastra still has a chance here. He all of a sudden has accelerated. He's now more than a minute ahead of the Armstrong group. And is this man Sable in a spot of bother at the back now? It looks as though it might well be. So he too has cracked. Well, he's hanging on. He hasn't gone yet. This is a horrendous climb in the fact that it just seems to go on forever and ever. It never gives up. The gradient, uh, the average is 7% all the way to the summit there. And that's where we're headed to right now on today's stage of the Tour de France. It's uphill all the way from here to the finishing line. Roberto Heras now. So Chechu has had to call best and he's sailing out the back there on the left. So there what a he job. Is. And look at the difference in the pace now. He's done a magnificent job, this man. He really is the super domestique that everyone would like to have on their team. One of the top Spanish climbers and now at the service of Lance Armstrong. This is why Roberto Heras has been kept in reserve. He waited until Rubiera had done all of the work that he could. Heras himself, Phil, is in eighth place in the overall classification. And now he's picking the pace making up and I don't think there's too many bike riders will be able to attack this pace because Roberto Heras is a brilliant bike rider. Now there's no easy uh, way to the top, there's no energy to be saved, there's no pain to be spared, he's just got to give it everything and hope now because this rider is on a high and he's still closing in, holding at 220 for the moment, so he hasn't closed in since the five kilometer banner. Bogart will respond, I think, to the many Dutch people on this climb who would not have been expecting to be cheering a Dutchman home today. But the difficult thing about this climb is it's never, it never gives up. The gradient continues all the way to the finish line. It's not like one or two of the climbs that we go up where at least there's a few moments of flat for Michael Bogart to recover. There is no flat at all from here all the way to the finish. We're now looking at Carlos Sastra making his way under the four kilometer to go banner. He's slowly but surely pulling himself closer, but hopefully for Michael Bogart, he deserves to win. And if the gods of cycling are breathing on his neck today, hopefully it's a tailwind. He's okay. pulled back 10 seconds in a kilometer as we go back to the bunch, and this is it, move now. Well, it's up to Balocchi and Romzas. They're the men behind Armstrong. He's had enough. He's going for it, and he still has a chance of catching the leader. And there's no reaction. No reaction at all. Raimundus Rumsas was on the front of the group, and he wants to really bang home today the, the superiority that he's had in the Tour de France so far. This is the man who is leading the bike race, Michael Bogard. He doesn't really know what's going on in the race behind him as Armstrong comes out, and he now is in lone pursuit of Carlos Sastra. Now, Armstrong has left himself enough time here to wipe out the two leaders, I think. This is unbelievable. It's absolute concentration. He waits for the moments that he wants to stamp his authority all over this bike race once again he sat in the slipstream of his team which really I think Phil now has to be regarded as the best team in the world he's made the contact with Carlos Sastra he'll come up alongside him uh, just a glance across to look at him two kilometers to go there it is Armstrong has joined the Sastra we'll get a time check shortly on Michael Bogart it's going to be tough for the man at the front of the race. He's really going to have to dig deep. His body will be telling him, please stop. Let me have a day off. Let me just finish the bike race right now. But he can't because he's now inside the one kilometer to go sign. And that, I think, is going to breathe a huge sigh of relief for this man because oh. now he will win the stage, Phil. He must have been worried a, a moment ago when he heard that the yellow jersey had flown out of the group. The sweat is pouring off the face of Lance Armstrong. The concentration is in his eyes. He's fixed on the sight of the road in front of him all he wants to do is build time between himself and the rest of the pack just how much more can Sastra take sitting on the back of this locomotive because it is 150 in fact that's good enough that's good enough for a well-deserved win by a great bike rider in Bogart 
Armstrong, I think, would not have wanted to have wiped him out after the journey over the Alps today for him. Uh, but more importantly to Lance, he is adding time with every turn of the pedals now, and he pedals pretty quickly. Sastra, I'm not too sure, will hang on if Lance kicks again at a kilometre. But these are the riders on second and third on the road. We've forgotten already about Bolocchi and Rumsas because our cameras are not going back to them anymore because we're watching Armstrong make good his overall lead in the Tour de France. Certain now to go over five minutes. Here they are. Bolocchi showing strain on his face now. So too Rumsas who has no more in there. Still we've got Ivan Basso confirming his lead in the white jersey as newcomer and young rider to the Tour de France. Leipheimer is still there as well and might even climb up one place overall. And I wasn't sure then, Paul, but I wasn't sure. I saw Heras. Heras was there, just caught a quick glimpse of him sitting on the back. He won't do anything at all to contribute. Look at this, he checks over his shoulder. He wants to know where is the yellow jersey. He knows he's coming fast, but he knows that he's a long way behind Armstrong now at the one-kilometre banner. It's very close, but in theory, Michael Berger should not be much more than 500 metres to go to the finish line. And he's smiling now. That was a smile. I was sure of that. He knows now they're not going to pick him up. It's a gentle right-hand bend as he comes up to the line here at La Plagne. He must feel as though he's just climbed from base level to the moon because this is such a mountain. And he's been the hero of the day. Is he breaking away from that group? Yes, he's going to love this one now. That's a real smile. It's been tough, you know, it's really been a long, hard 18-kilometre climb and once he heard the yellow jersey had escaped the pack, he must have wondered whether he had enough time, but now he has and he'll enjoy this victory salute because he's been dreaming about it for almost three and a half hours. And probably more than that, Paul, probably six years because that's when he last won his only stage of the Tour de France in the pouring rain of Aix-les-Bains in 1996. At that time, he was being tipped as a winner of the Tour de France. He finished 10th last year, he has finished fifth in the past the crowd react to a hero of the mountains today he can't believe he held them off that is an extraordinary performance that will go down as one of the best well done Bogart Unbelievable. And somebody better catch him they better catch him pretty quickly and the man there just getting inside because it actually does not level out at all Armstrong is 500 meters from the finish line right now but what a great win by Bogart they're actually lowering up, up his bike in front of us remarkable victory five hours and 48 minutes for Michael Bogart he is in absolute tears here and he doesn't have to laugh, cry, kiss the nearest man he can catch hold of. He doesn't know what to do in front of us as we go back to Armstrong. Still gaining on all of his rivals in the Tour de France. Going into the final showdown in the mountains tomorrow and they will, won't know what to do. He's just eased up here. And he's like allowed he's coming in from a training ride. It's, a, my, it's, it's amazing. Ridiculous. It really is incredible. The man has planned this Tour de France to absolute perfection, Phil. He's ridden these climbs more than anybody else, and that, I think, is the secret of his success. He goes out in the early part of the year when the temperatures are absolute freezing in snowstorms, rainstorms, and he wants to know just exactly how his body's going to react. Well, there's a couple of seconds difference in time bonus between second and third, and for that reason, I think that's why Armstrong has put uh, Sastra in front of him, because he might well out-sprint him to the line. This big man towers over the little build of Carlos Sastra. He doesn't come round him. He says thanks. At 1.26, Armstrong comes through. Oh, he's just going to pedal through and look for the showers. By the look of it, here comes Bolocchi in fourth place. Bolocchi accelerating away. Rumsas, the limpet, is still locked on his back wheel, but he's not got the better of Bolocchi yet. He still wants those seconds to claim second of Bolocchi. Bolocchi, I think, will be hard to do that, but he, Rumsas is a better time trialist than Joshiba Bolocchi. They're split at the moment by enough time, possibly, but Bolocchi will feel safer if he gains a bit more time by the line, and I would say that's a fourth for Bolocchi, and the time gap... Uh, just over two minutes two minutes that means that Armstrong will lead tonight by six and a quarter minutes so there's the state result Bogard a worthy winner Armstrong too magnanimous to take second place off Sast and Bellocchi losing more time to the leader and apparently concerned now mainly with marking the man behind him in the standings Raimondus Rumsas 
The man who started the day in fourth place, Igor Gonzalez de Galdiano, finished the best part of five minutes down on the day, which dropped him a place in the overall standings. David Miller, meanwhile, was in the late arriving auto bus along with Robbie McEwen, 34 and a half minutes back, and neither of them was driving. Well, you can always count on Michael Boger to give good slow-mo. Produced one of the great tour reactions in 1996 when he won his first stage in Aix-les-Bains, and here he did everything but get off and wave his bike at the finish. After riding 150 kilometers on his own, though, he deserved it. After Richard Vironc and Santiago Botero, a great breakaway stage win for the third day running. And that ride has Bogard up into 12th, at least for a day, while David Miller is now down to 69th, perhaps saving his legs for another stage win. At the top, though, Lance Armstrong's calculated stranglehold on the race continues to tighten. His lead over Joseba Balocchi is now over five minutes. Yeah, I'm very happy. It was, it's a, a, a boy's dream, how you call that in English, but it's, for me it's a, a dream and uh, it has come true. And I'm happy for Michael. I think he, he rode a hell of a stage. He was out there all day. And, uh, and when somebody does that and, and spends a lot of the day alone, when it was hilly, it was windy, it was, uh, it was tough. So he, he deserves it. I hope, but I think to, to overrule this is really hard for me. <laughs> I think this is my best win ever. I feel really good this tour, actually, and uh, especially in the climbs, more so than, than in the time trials. But uh, I know these stages really well. I mean, La Plana I know very, very well, and so I was comfortable on the climb. The team was in control and kept the rhythm consistent, so I didn't, I didn't have to kill myself early on, and I did feel, I felt very good. And there's a shot of him feeling very good. Lance is still talking about the next two stages as being very tricky, but on the evidence of his chief rival's unwillingness or perhaps inability to attack him, the race now seems to be for second place. You know, Lance Armstrong is the most popular tour winner there's ever been in America. Here in France, the public have never really taken to him, and even on a race like this year's where he's riding like a true champion, some people still refuse to acknowledge his achievements. Not deafening, but unmistakably there, the sound of the best rider on the tour being booed up Mont Ventoux. Ahead of him was a Frenchman who's been suspended for drug use and warmly welcomed back into the affections of the sporting public. Armstrong, who's yet to test positive for anything but fanatical dedication to his craft, is still viewed with suspicion in some quarters, mainly, it seems, for being implausibly good. It's sometimes frustrating because you see riders they accept, riders they really cherish and love and cuddle and, and scream for, and it's the guys that in the group you say, I don't ever want to be like that guy. If it's any consolation to Armstrong, he's in excellent company. The roll call of riders disliked for their sheer domination of the sport include the likes of Eddie Merckx, who was kidney-punched out of contention by a French fan in the 1975 race, and even five-time champion Bernard Hino, the last Frenchman to win the Tour. J'ai l'impression que, que j'ai, moi, c'est que les Français, ils aiment bien ceux qui sont seconds, ils aiment pas ceux qui gagnent. Je fais le père Jacques Anquetil, qui était un de nos, de nos anciens, avait les mêmes problèmes, et moi j'ai eu ces, ces problèmes le, le jour où j'ai perdu la, le Tour, quand j'ai pas gagné, on a dit, le pauvre malheureux. Je dis non Si j'ai pas gagné, c'est que parce que j'ai peut-être pas fait ce qu'il fallait pour gagner. Et quand j'ai gagné, certains m'ont sifflé, on dit c'est pas normal, il triche, ou il fait pas, il, c'est pas normal qu'il gagne autant de fois. He knows advice to Armstrong is to learn to live with it, and Armstrong anyway is a rider adept at turning adversity into motivation. Still, he lives in hope that if he perseveres, the public might come round. No offense, but I want to be the guy that just keeps his mouth shut, works hard, true to his team, true to his family, true to his sport. He gives a full effort and wins the race. That's the guy that I want to be. I don't want to put a flower on my head or take a picture or, or, or do a song and dance. I just want to be a sportsman and win the biggest bike race in the world. And that's what you kind of hope that the people on the roadside say, look at there, in French. They would say, chapeau, look at the guy. Trained harder than anybody else, wanted it more than anybody else, and he got it. Well, barring accident or injury, he has got it, and getting over the last of the Alps would confirm it. Today's stage had three big ones, and as on every mountain stage this year, the weather was baking for the riders, beautiful for the helicopter shots. Stage 17 to Clues, and the three leaders, Mario Ertz, Dario Frigo, and Giuseppe Guarini, are racing off the last big climb of this year's tour.
towards the finish. The switchbacks of the Col de Colombia on the descent now. Frigo was dropped at the top, but he came back on the flat. And that's him in second place. But again, Paul, Mario Ertz is showing them, even if he is a Belgian, he knows how to go up and down mountains. As we're now looking at one of the groups caught in the middle, and they, in fact, uh, regrouped somewhat on the descent here. And uh, there's somebody just going around the corner there, and it may well be that that is Santiago Botero, because he is giving it full gas on this descent in fact he isn't he's still off the back with his teammate this is uh, Gutierrez who's trying to stay in contact with his own teammate right now I think the group just of the ahead. men who are in between are just in front of those cars there but look at the descent here by Santiago Botero and this is the one. yellow jersey group and watch out now because Garini is waiting here he's going to take a flyer from the back he's lined off just far enough to gather that speed and Frigo, I would have thought, would not want to be in first place right now, and yet he seems to be content to hold it. And Ertz is rather like a track finish, because here it goes. He gave plenty of warning to everybody, and he's being chased by Mario Ertz. And I think that might send the advantage to Ertz, because Garini has gone far too far out at a kilometre to go. He'll have to do it all again. Now, this is the turn that Paul mentioned as we start to sweep around the corner here. And a massive, massive crowd in Clouse up, but there's no straight finish here in the last kilometre today of the Tour de France. Ertz has done well to shut off, and here goes the counter. Frigo tempting them to open up the sprint. Nobody wants to lead it out, of course, because that's the advantage to the other two. And they go again. In fact, they were ahead with, they hesitated there because Frigo is looking at Ertz, and this might be it. Garini, the man that last won on the top of Alduez, when Eric the photographer knocked him down inside of the finish, he's gone again. It's a desperate end, and Ertz is time trialing his way back up, and he's beat him, he's caught him, he's hooked up. This is a desperate finish for men who are not pure sprinters. Well, here's where he must go again, but Mario Ertz, his only win of the year, the flesh belong classic in Belgium, and to, to Coney Sports, Dario Frigo is going to get the win. The man who dangled off the back of the race on the descent, they should have got rid of him because he's won the day. The field are right behind him, Botero still pushing at the front as Santiago Botero looks for more time to try and break into the top four as well overall. Well, in the Alps, Botero has been the only man with the legs, all the cojones to attack Armstrong. He came in 11th, 2.58 behind the stage winner Dario Frigo, with poor old Mario Ertz second for the second time in three days. Four and a half minutes back was the group containing Lance Armstrong, Joseba Bellocchi, Raimundus Rumsas, and Igor Gonzalez de Galdiano. So, as expected, not even a nibble at Armstrong's lead. In a group nearly 20 minutes back were Eric Zabel and David Miller. Robbie McEwen, another three minutes behind them. McEwen and Zabel thinking ahead to the resumption of their green jersey battle tomorrow. A shorter victory in the King of the Mountains competition now is Laurent Jalabert, on account of there being pretty well none left. Although Kamikaze of the Mountains might be a more apt title, considering where he actually finished on most of the mountain stages. Santiago Botero lost his second place in that competition today to Mario Ertz, but in the overall standings, he's ridden himself back into fourth, one place higher than he was before he lost all that time on Mont Ventoux. Lance Armstrong keeps his lead exactly as it was this morning, and he'll no doubt have his eye on the final time trial himself as a way of signing off on his fourth Tour win. Stage 18 was back on the flat, well, flattish, and that meant the resumption of the tightest race in the Tour. Short of having an armhole each, Robbie McEwen and Eric Zabel couldn't be any closer in the green jersey competition, tied on 229 points apiece, with Stuart O'Grady too far adrift in third to really enter the equation, and McEwen actually wearing the jersey, only courtesy of a better record in the daily hotspot sprints. Now coming up was the individual time trial where neither rider would score any points, so the race was going to be decided on the road to Bourg-en-Bresse, and the final day to Paris. Which is exactly the point it came down to last year, with Eric Zabel only overhauling Stuart O'Grady on the final hotspot sprint of the Tour. This year O'Grady has been eclipsed by his fellow Aussie, Robbie McEwen, and so to a large extent as Zabel. The German, of course, is the incumbent, and he's been winning this competition long enough for his son to grow up on the podium. Never mind marks on the kitchen wall, Zabel Jr's height chart has been done by the cream of the world's sports photographers in six annual instalments. In a straight sprint, though, the German is clearly slower than the Aussie this year. And on yesterday's stage, Zabel acknowledged it. 
The first hot spot sprint came after only 10 kilometres, a rare opportunity on a mountain stage for the two main men still to be up front and battling for points. However, Zabel sent his teammate Rolf Aldag ahead on a solo break a couple of kilometres in advance in order to mop up the points and make sure there was no sprint. Not a tactic that impressed McEwen. Shows he's a little bit scared, I guess, and didn't want to sprint. Uh, for me, I, I didn't really care either way. The points are equal, but I still have the jersey, so technically I'm in front and he has to go and find the points. And if he wants to let his teammates go and take the points, then it's not going to help him any, so that's fine by me. But Zabel hasn't won six straight green jerseys without being smart as well as fast. He knows he's stronger over rolling terrain than McEwen, and he fancies his chances today on what is actually a very hilly course. There are also rumours that he's been offered the help of Lance Armstrong towards a record seventh title. Unsubstantiated, of course, and strictly against the race rules, if true. What is known, though, is that Armstrong and McEwen aren't the best of mates. And if Robbie's going to become the first Australian to win the green jersey, falling out with the patron of the peloton isn't perhaps the best way to go about it. Today's route was, in official tour terminology, a rolling stage. In plain English, full of nasty little climbs and not easy at all for the sprinters. Nonetheless, there were two intermediate sprints, neither particularly flat, with the usual six, four and two points on offer for the first three riders. And points for the first 20 placings at the finish. Well, there were no points for either McEwen or Zabel at the first sprint of the day. It's for the second day running, Zabel had been happy to send one of his helpers away. His top lead-out man, actually, Gian Matteo Fagnini, who got in a ten-man break that took all the points. There are two races in progress on the road to Bourg-en-Bresse. One for the stage win between the three leaders, Hushoft, Montjant of Crediac. Another one behind them to decide who's going to take the green jersey. Inside the kite, one kilometre. One kilometre to go. Now, don't forget the man in the green jersey won the sprint yesterday for fifth place. He was on a mountain stage and he's not known as a mountain climber. The man on the front from France, he wants to try and get the win. He's in an ideal position right now, pushing the huge Norwegian into first place. We're, oh, we're going to get the tactics coming now, Phil. They're all over the road and they've been away at the front of this bike race since kilometre number two. And right now, the most important kilometre for them is this last one. Hushoff looks very confident, but he knows the Frenchman has got a very big kick. They are waiting. He's waiting for the sound of the tyres accelerating behind him, and then he will open up the sprint. 500 metres to go. Monja is still in second, looking over his shoulder to see if there's going to be the return of the group. There won't be. The winner will come from these three men. Well, licking his lips there, Christophe Manjon, he's forced the younger rider to lead him out, which is brilliant, but watch out for Jakob Peel, he can sprint very, very well when it matters. As they come off this bend, they're riding right against the barriers, that sensible riding by Hochoff to force the attack through on his left. Oh, and Peel pulled his foot off the pedal, it's all over for him, as now this man goes for the line. Now, can Manjon come? Here comes the kick of Christophe Manjon now, but he's going to be given a run for his money, he's just going to nose ahead on the line and I think and he thinks so too that Hushoff has won at the stage that was an absolutely fabulous sprint well there's the sprint now let's see if we can see it here well it's quite uh, it's quite clear from that angle isn't it he's won it by a quarter of a wheel absolutely no problem at all still in control of the peloton at 900 meters is US Postal Danilo Hondo uh, priming himself up here to lead Eric Zabel to the Hope Green jersey Watch out on the far right for Robbie McEwen. He looks so cool there as he sits on the back wheel of Zabel. He's waiting for Zabel to make the move now. We go back three weeks when Zabel used to complain that Robbie McEwen always follows me. I think we had a crash there to look like something. Maybe we didn't. As we come into the home straight now, now Hondo has got the lead. Now the big lead out coming from Ralph Olduck. This could be a lead out for Zabel. McEwen is two riders back here. Jan Zerada is butting in for the first time. He's the third wheel now. And fourth is Zabel. Fifth is McEwen. McEwen as we come into the straight now, the big effort, the big lead out, it still looks as though McEwen has a good position, now he's going on the left of the road, it's all clear sailing for McEwen here, because they've given him the perfect lead out, on the line, McEwen gets it, and that will give him a one point advantage. Took a point, that was the idea of the day, to be honest I was, uh, I was really worried about this stage, and I'd lose points, ends up I've taken another one. So that gives me confidence. It was a hard sprint. They're very fast at the end, but uh, I was able to come past Eric, so it's been a top day. It's all going to come down to the Champs Elysees. Not an ideal situation, I presume, but how are you feeling about it? Well, Eric's uh, got it now uh, a one point deficit to make up. So it's up to him to, and his team to do the work for the intermediate sprints, and it's up to me to try and pass him. So 
that's the ideal situation at the moment. So tomorrow's time trial, you'll just be going through the motion, saving all your energy for the Champs Elysees. Exactly. By the time we got to him, Eric Zaba was already resting his vocal cords, heading straight into the telecom bus to contemplate perhaps the loss of his points Eric, title after six points years points of domination. So that's the stage result, off the head of Montjean in what was a two-man sprint in the end after Peel pulled his foot out of the pedal. And the Norwegian, who had a miserable first week hanging on at the back of the race, redeems his tour and that of his team on the last road stage but one. The last couple of days I am feeling good and uh, the, after 10k I went to the right uh, breakaway and uh, I did a perfect technical race so I was there with three guys and I was the strongest in the sprint so that yeah, was good. So no recourse to the rule book today. McEwen leading the green jersey competition by a whole point. Just three sprints to come now on Sunday. And he knows that whatever tactic Zabel throws at him are of limited use against sheer speed. Now Armstrong isn't the kind of champion who's happy to take a lead, mark his rivals and make it to Paris with the minimum of fuss. He believes that the strongest man in the race has a responsibility to demonstrate it, especially when he's wearing the yellow jersey. However, having lost the first long time trial of this tour, he was well aware who the big threat would be in the second. Well, this is the time everybody's waiting to see now, but Teru has been heading up the checks there, Armstrong coming through them slightly slower, so this surely is now the time to beat, and he hits the line, one hour, two minutes, 18 seconds, now Armstrong really will have to do something special. He is not going to win the time trial. Santiago Botero has got a great scalp here. As Armstrong comes up, he will be 10 seconds down. 1, 2, 29 for Armstrong. Botero, everybody will, everybody will say one person. I mean, he won the first one. He's won a lot of time trials this year. He looks, still looks good in the race. So, he's my pick. So fast forward to Sunday morning. Just tell us how you're going to be feeling. Probably hung over from Saturday night. No, just kidding. <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> it was a joke. That's his first joke in four years. And there's a look at how things stood coming into today's stage. Armstrong with his five-minute lead over Yoseba Belocki, and Belocki looking over his shoulder at Raimondus Rumsas, who was hoping to time trial his way up into second place. The course was 50 kilometres of sun-baked roads, with the first time check 10.5 kilometres in at the top of a testing climb. So, as we pick it up, just the top four men left in the Tour de France have to start. Botero, Romzas, Belocchi and Armstrong. Well, we're looking at this face now as Santiago Botero, a man that lost 15 minutes on the mountains of Ventoux, somehow bounced back and now is challenging for a podium place in Paris. Now, can he make Colombia completely happy and get the time that will take him into third place? Raimundus Rumzas aiming now to become the first Lithuanian to get a place in Paris. A good start for him, very quickly up to the tempo required to keep the speed at an average of 46 kilometers an hour to take out victory here if he can. On the finish line, it's still Bodrogi first, Miller and then Honchar. Armstrong is underway, a very important day for Lance. Yes, he's going to win the Tour de France, but I think right now he wants to go out with an even bigger flagpole, and that's to win this as well. Lance Armstrong blazing a lone furrow across the vineyards here near Macon. The undulations, this is a tough one. It's a hard time trial. It might favour the men who are coming out strongest in this race. And certainly Armstrong is one of those. Look at this crowd here now as he changes direction. Even the police there applauding the Mayo Journal of the Tour de France and holding the left of the road, taking the shortest way possible. And now Raimundus runs us, still trying now for a time that will reshape the leaderboard. And I wonder, Paul, I'm expecting best time here. This is an unbelievable crowd here at the summit of this mountain and I don't think anybody has jeered Lance Armstrong. It's a complete accolade from France for the man in the yellow jersey. They recognise the Mayo Jean of the Tour de France. They cheer and shout him on. Just look at this Mexican wave right before him. Absolutely incredible atmosphere for Lance. The helicopter ahead waiting for him as the check approaches. And he's gone through that check and he's gone through in second place. 17 seconds behind Rumzas. There it is. 
Armstrong just off the pace, but a slower start, Paul, because the course is hard here, might mean a stronger finish today. Look at this, it is much closer to uh, a half a minute in front of Miller's time. This man is burning up the road. As he now comes up to the line in 44-54. Now there's the target for Armstrong to aim at. He is approximately six minutes behind at this point. So 44-54, Raimundus Ramzas surviving to the 33rd kilometer and still giving it his best effort here. Armstrong now in the streets of Shan. He's too now looking to find out whether he can rival Raimundus Rumsas at the 33 kilometer time check and look at this time right now the man from Texas has picked oh. up the pacemaking Phil he is accelerating he's totally liberated right now he's still got a little way to go before he gets to that time check but it is going to be a remarkable time for Lance Armstrong Raimundus Rumsas was the fastest man at this point but right now the yellow jersey is beginning to dominate well he's reversed it on this sector of the course which is harder than the open opening sector and I thought that Ramzas looked as though he was beginning to suffer he has now reversed a 17 second deficit here Lance Armstrong into an advantage of well I don't know what the advantage was now it's switched 44 47 anyway for Armstrong the next man to come to the line will be this man, the, the huge success in Colombia, Santiago Botero. He's won three stages at the Tour de France over his lifetime. He's won the King of the Mountains. He's one of the rare men to beat Lance Armstrong in an individual time trial at the Tour de France. And right now what he's looking at is trying to make sure that he keeps himself up in fourth place because he's not going to win the time trial today as he did between Lannister and Lorient. He should nicely finish in fourth place and continue his progress as a newcomer, comparative newcomer, into the Tour de France. Former King of the Mountains in the Tour de France, Santiago Botero. Veloci has gone through in sixth place, a minute 22 off at 44.5 uh, kilometers covered as we watch Botero finish. Another man who's coming in here with a time very close to his representative's overall position. Sixth place at the moment, can't be worse than eighth now, ninth. 1601 for Botero. But Rumsas now is in the finishing straight. He's digging very deep. He's done an absolutely superb time trial. What will be important for him, though, Phil, is not his time on the line right now because he's not going to win the time trial. The time between himself and Yosiba Belocki is what is important. And Raimundus Rumsas will rue the day. He allowed Belocki to spring clear of him on those hilltop finishes and gain a handful of seconds because he's cost him second place in the Tour de France. He comes home currently to a cheer and he gets the best time but wait for the arrival of Armstrong 1 4 43 for Ramzas and that when all the calculations are complete I think he'll have lost second place in the Tour de France by about 45 seconds this is Balocchi now heading down towards the finishing line every second will count he should be okay but he's aiming for a time not worse than one hour seven minutes and one second if it is then he'll stand in his familiar third place on the podium in Paris Armstrong has been the leader at the second and third check. He had to reverse a 17-second deficit on Rumzas. Rumzas has finished with the best time of 1.443. And Balocchi, now racing into the last kilometre, cannot do worse than 1.701. He is safe now. It'll be a 1.6-something, so that'll give him the victory of second place by about that 45 seconds I mentioned because as he comes up to the line, there's the time of Rumzas Balocchi, not the best time trialist in the world, but boy, did he suffer today to conserve his second place in the Tour de France. Hits the line in 1.601. He saved it by a minute. Well, that was a brilliant ride by him. He really must have dug deep to stay there and keep himself in second position. It was a position he wanted to keep, but right now we're waiting for just one man out on the road. The time to beat is 1.04.43 of Raimundes Rumsas. Armstrong is not far away right now, and I tell you one thing, this crowd is going to give him a huge ovation he's in the corner now Phil this is an unbelievable ride the clock says 1 0 3 31 and listen to the crowd bring the American champion home well I'll tell you this man another two kilometers would have caught Belocchi for three minutes as Armstrong now comes in Belocchi's 1 6 1 and Armstrong just over two minutes quicker than him as he races to the line to the victory 1 3 50 
there's no argument who the champion is of the Tour de France for the fourth year in succession. So Lance Armstrong with a time of one hour, three minutes and 50 seconds has won his eighth time trial in a Tour de France and this has confirmed him once again as the man who is the champion of the Tour. Anyway, there are no reruns for equipment failure, so Rumzaz was an excellent second to Armstrong's superlative first. Uh, you know, Santi is uh, up and down. I mean, he's an awesome rider, but some days he's, uh, he's like Superman, and other days he's a regular man. So uh, maybe, maybe it was too hot. Maybe he started too too fast. I don't know. But uh, you're right. I did say I did say Botero, but. I, I forgot to talk and think about Rumsus, and I should have because he was motivated to try to catch Baloki and, and move from third to second, and he showed it, showed that he was motivated. And Rumsas might have done even better with a decent Allen key. In the latter stages of the race, half his energy was directed at keeping his loose handlebars straight, and who knows how much time he might have made up on Baloki otherwise. So 3,133 kilometres down, 144 to go, finishing with 10 laps of the chicest cycle track in the world. Ample opportunity then for the Americans in Paris, and there were plenty of them, to get a good look at their man Lance Armstrong as he finished off his fourth consecutive Tour de France victory. On the eve of it, he sat down with Paul Schoen. It's 4,000 kilometres, so there's never uh, a three-week race like that where you don't come under pressure and stress about certain things and have crises in the race. The crash, or not the crash, but the incident there in, in Avranche was, was a stressful moment. Um, losing time in the team time trial, losing the first individual time trial. Those were stressful points. Four years ago when you came to the Tour, you didn't know you were going to win it in 1999. And, and when you took the lead, people said, oh, this guy's got a weak team, they can't defend. Mm -hmm. This year, the team's been unbelievable. Mm -hmm. Well, we've, over the years, we've tried and tried and tried to improve the team. Everything about it, between riders, staff, equipment, training, uh, mental preparation, everything. And, and finally, I think we're to the point where the team is, is uh, uh, at least this year, is close to perfect. And the team made life incredibly easy. And I am very proud of this team. Well, if you ask me what was uh, one of the most uh, significant and intense moments, uh, I would also say the climb to La Mangie with, with Roberto because uh, he was flying that day. And I was, that, I mean, that, that was the most trouble I was in the entire Tour de France on my own teammates' wheel. <laughs> I don't tell people to slow down very often, but I was begging him to slow down. <laughs> What's going to make you stop one day? Because I, I get the impression one day you'll just get up and say, forget it. I don't know. <laughs> it's, I mean, what can I say? I mean, uh, the way I race and train and uh, feel about the bike now is exactly the way it was four years ago. So it's not uh, diminishing, it's not changing. Uh, still Kids growing up. The kids are getting older, which makes it harder. Uh, I've yet to have a day where Luke says, uh, don't go on the bike or don't go to the race or where are you going, why? That day might be difficult, but I think he thinks it's kind of cool. He thinks it's, if, if he, as long as he can watch the race on TV, which he can do most of the time in Europe, then we're okay. Well, there are the hard facts of Armstrong Sr.'s fourth consecutive Tour de France win. Seven minutes ahead of Joseba Balocchi of Spain. Lithuania's Raimundus Rumsas, the surprise of the race in third. Santiago Botero of Colombia, fourth. And Balocchi's Spanish teammate, Igor González de Galdiano, fifth. David Miller is completing his second fall tour in 68th with a superb stage win to his credit. Now, just because Lance Armstrong was rolling gaily into Paris, fielding the occasional endorsement offer on his radio earpiece, didn't mean there'd be no racing on the last day. In fact, the final stage was shaping up as one of the most exciting for years. Robbie McEwen and Eric Zabel each had one stage win in the Tour. They'd both finished second, and they'd been splitting the daily hotspot sprints all the way from Luxembourg to Paris. In fact, until stage 18, they'd been tied on points before McEwen beat Zabel in Bourg-en-Bresse to come into the final stage, leading by a single point. No Australian had ever won the green jersey, while Zabel, remember, had won six in a row. As things stood, though, the advantage was with McEwen. 
Yeah, well, always at the finish on the Champs say I think just about everyone in the race wants to sprint there. Even if they can't sprint, they want to get a result, and everybody's excited on the last day on the Champs say But uh, I think it could be decided almost on the, the two intermediate sprints before the finish. So you're feeling strong, you're feeling good? I feel good, yeah. Yesterday I, I had a good day. It was the stage that worried me the most. Um, but I'm still very, very wary of Eric Sabel. And uh, I know he, he still hasn't given up. Um, and, yeah, he could have some trick up his sleeve. Are you nervous, the final day? Oh, of course, I'm a little bit nervous. It's normal. But uh, good nerves. Well, they started the day separated by a point and there were 47 up for grabs on the stage. Six for the first man through each of the two hotspot sprints and 35 for the stage winner against 30 for second place. So it looked like going all the way down to the line. Before the serious business of the day began though, it was the usual last day of turn behavior. Boys bringing in their monopoly sets, Lance Armstrong leading the posties in a rolling toast, that sort of thing. Lauren Jalabert seemed to be on an uncharacteristically self-congratulatory bike although it actually turned out to be a present from the manufacturers. Anyway, hilarity was suspended for the first sprint of the day, which came after 54 kilometres. Her example had the telecom lead-out train, but McEwen had the superior speed. He took six for first place, Zabel four for second, and that meant McEwen's lead was up to three points in the green jersey competition. As we pick up the race, it's heading towards the Champs-Élysées and the home riders are jockeying for position at the front. Well, this is interesting. That's Christophe Agnoluto on the front there. Andrea Perron up into second place. I'm not sure if that is Zabel. It looks actually as if it might be Stefan Weissermann. I can't see the green jersey anywhere at all. So that means at the end of the day that this is going to go down to the very final sprint. Do you know what? I think they might well have said to each other, let's just go and sprint for the win and leave it at that because there was no reaction from either McEwen or Zabel. So we go to the finish of this race now today with 35 points for the winner, 30 points for the second and there are three points between the two. Heras got the six points, the first time he'd ever won it. Landis in second and so that was a little bit of a benefit of it. Do you hear that? There's the bell. Well, there you go. This means just one lap to go for these riders, Phil. Seven kilometres left of the Tour de France of this year, and it's the last Tour de France for Laurent Jalabert. And what a remarkable career this man has had. Jalabert had nine wins when he raced for the Toshiba team, 143 wins when he raced for Onse, 12 wins when he rode for CSC Tiscali, and what a great way to go out of the Tour de France. Moving forward right now, we've got Lampre on the front. This is a brilliant move for these guys. This again is Raimundus Rumsas looking for the gap. I cannot believe it. This man will not lay down arms. He wants second place if he can. Well, there's no way he'll get it now. This will now go down in the list of cheeky moves because he's not going to get a minute in the last 6K of riding. But where is the green jersey? He sat right in the back pocket of Eric Zabel as he turned under the shadow of the Arc de Triomphe. Rumsas is becoming the first Lithuanian cyclist to go on the podium in any Tour de France in 89 editions of the event. Uh, but it's all too late. There's no way this man can get a minute. Look at the speed of the race. I don't think it's going to happen, but what a show of aggression as he comes off the front. The sprinters must get it back together right now as we go through. There's another move coming off the front. It looks like the Covidist rider Cedric Vasseur going clear across the Place de la Concorde for the last time. We're now looking at around about three and a half kilometres to the finish. The whole of the field that will be together, I would say, Phil, when we come back. Lance Armstrong has won the Tour de France under the rules you cannot lose in the last kilometre, whatever happens, so let's watch the front now. As Daniel Honda brings on to the top player, Chance and Lise now, the two men fight him a green. Watch for the boy in pink off to the right and watch also for the whereabouts of the green jersey. Because as the, in fact it's out of it, Robbie, uh, Robbie McEwen has won the green jersey, is he going to win the stage? He's taking on Ben Cook, but on the line, Robbie, uh, Robbie McEwen has gone out. The best results you could possibly hope for. He's won this stage before, but now, just as Lance Armstrong yesterday wanted to win the time trial in yellow, and there he is, 
Robbie McEwen has taken the green jersey in the finest possible manner, and I think he's crying. But look at the face of Robbie McEwen, Phil. Absolutely unbelievable. This proves that he is the top sprinter of this year's tour, and he's worthy. He's very, very worthy of the green jersey at the end of the day. Oh, that's fantastic. I mean, to top it off with a stage win, it's been a really nervous race, and uh, I haven't slept well the last days, obviously. And I've been able to top it off with that. And uh, at this stage, I'm still more relieved than happy. But happier than Eric Zabel, not so much dethroned after six years as abdicating in the home straight, and not even featuring in the final sprint, which McEwen took ahead of a future Aussie contender for the competition, Baden Cook and Damien Nazon. Zabel came in seventh. So McEwen winning the points competition the way you're supposed to by winning a stage. His second on the Champs Elysees, incidentally, and that meant double duty on the podium. The first ever Australian winner of the green jersey, receiving it coincidentally from the Australian ambassador to France. Laurent Jalabert had the King of the Mountains competition wrapped up a couple of days ago, and he also heads into retirement with the title of the Tour's most aggressive rider. Best young rider was Italy's Ivan Basso, who took the white jersey off David Miller mid-tour and never looked like losing it. Best team were on say, but only officially. The real best team was the one that carried Lance Armstrong to his fourth consecutive tour victory. And there are the facts and figures of it. Armstrong completing the 3,277 kilometres in 82 hours, 5 minutes and 12 seconds. 7.17 ahead of Spain's Joseba Balocchi, second this year after two third places with Raimundus Rumsas of Lithuania, the surprise occupant of the podium in third. You know, he likes to name his tours Lance, or at least America likes him to name them. And after the comeback, the confirmation and last year's enjoyable tour, this was undoubtedly the tour of the team. They all have their little uh, characteristics and, and emotions and memories. And uh, look, they're all special. You wouldn't pick one over the other, but uh, you know, the newest one and the latest one is always the most the most special at that time. And right now, we're just all so happy, and it's a great team. No idea what 2003 is going to be called, but it should be well worth watching.